Good afternoon to all. Respected teachers, professors, my colleagues, dear participants, and the eminent speaker across the country, as well as from abroad also. I, Dr. Mona Lisa Thibor, on behalf of the organizing committee member of Mampun Mohavidyalay, welcome each of you to this webinar on physics, having entitled "Mystery of Nucleus." Today we got our speakers from abroad and from India also. Our speakers will share their insightful thought to the students, to the participants, and to all of us, which definitely makes us benefited for our forthcoming academic purpose as well as research also. Before moving to the main event, we will proceed for the inaugural session. For this, I would like to invite our teacher in charge of Manbhu Mohabidhaloy, Dr. Partho Sarutti Mondal, to inaugurate the session and say something about this. Now, I share the screen. Directly to the Partho sir. Sir, please. Oh, thank you, uh, Mona Lisa, for your kind introduction. So it has been a very nice occasion to organize such a webinar in the department of uh, physics. We all know that we are uh, physically we are cut up. We are not in a position to be there to the campus, to the college, to meet the students. But still, uh, with the help of electronics media, with the help of, I mean, internet and all, we are in a position to share our views, to, to, to cultivate our knowledge. So, I am very happy that our Department of Physics, uh, headed by Dr. Dhevar, is in a position to organize a webinar on uh, in in his, in her department, and we are lucky to have some eminent speakers from home and abroad, and I hope that their insightful uh, deliberation will help us, will help our participants to to learn many things, and. Uh, and the kind of monotony that this lockdown uh, has created will be a little bit, will be relieved. And I hope that soon we'll be back to the campus. So long we are not in a position to be in the campus, the medium, the best medium that we have, that the use of internet, uh, applying, uh, I mean, this Google Meet and Zoom or other such apps, we should, rather we would and will do, cultivate, disseminate uh, knowledge. The benefits will be, uh, I mean, for all who are related to it, will come to this platform. And I wish a very grand success to this webinar and thanking you all, the participants, the speakers, the department, our IQC, um, I mean, coordinator, the very uh, the team. Uh, I thank them all uh, for this kind of uh, organize. I mean, this kind of occasion. So, with a with a very uh, good wishes, I conclude my talk here, and I hand over it to uh, Professor Dhirva to proceed further uh, with the uh, schedule program of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
for your kind words thank you sir for your kind words so before entering to the main event i would like to announce couple of information here such as we have four speaker today each of them will deliver their talk for 30 minutes followed by 15 minutes discussion session here i would like to recommend all the participants please feel free to ask anything to our speakers whatever you have in mind any questions any queries any suggestion please feel free to ask them therefore after the talk three of the students will make their presentation on their respective papers the session will be for 30 minutes each also for them followed by 15 minutes discussion one more important announce at around 5:30 pm the feedback form will be delivered to all of you and i request each of one please do fill the form and submit it with the valid email ids through which we will provide you the participation certificates within 5 to 7 days in case any problem you can contact our team members the contacts of the team members will be given in through chat box okay so now i enter the main program so our first speaker is dr chiranjeev mondal from lpc university de corn normandy france dr chiranjeev mondal before that chiranjeev is here chiranjeev hello you, are you there uh there was some connection problem because uh, from my institute the firewall is not uh, allowing my google meet to to get uh, stay connected for more than 5 minutes so i was talking to tathagat though if he can take my slot then in the meanwhile i go back to my apartment where the internet is free so okay that's connect. fine that's fine so tathagat are you ready yeah i'm ready okay so because due to some internet problem we are changing our slots between to chiranjeev mondal and tathagat banerji so first speaker is tathagat he is basically a research scientist at uh, gina joint institute for nuclear reactions russia dubna let's have a brief introduction about our speaker dr banerji did his bsc from ramkrishna mission residential college narendrapur then he did his msc from calcutta university after that he did his doctorate degree from inter university accelerator center new delhi dr banerjee has published many papers in many prestigious journals he has a couple of interest in the experimental as well as nuclear physics core area so today tathagat please deliver we talk i am handing over the screen to you tathagat please okay so uh how to how to share here uh, a window monadi uh, how to share i will tell you i will tell you okay uh -huh. so could you see that three dots there yes uh, please click on that okay then you see that uh, uh, share your screen uh share your screen no yes. sir nothing is here 
no, no. Uh, see where your microphone and the video and the calling is there. So there you can see that uh, present now or share option. Ah, uh, present now is here. Ah, uh, yes, present. Now. Okay. Present. You present. Then, then there are three options. Your entire screen, a window, and a Chrome tab. So then, uh, your entire screen. If I do, there's nothing here. Entire screen. Entire screen. Ah, uh, then nothing is coming. Well, let me check. Ah, uh -huh. no, now it has. Come. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Can you see it? Well, it will come. Okay. It will come. It will come. Uh, no, no, it's not coming. Uh, participants, anyone can uh, are visible to see the screen? Yes, yes, Monalisha, it's visible. Oh, okay, it's visible. So you are not seeing, Monali. Uh, okay, okay, let me let me check it. So participants uh, can see the screen. Okay, all right, all right, all right, got it. Right, right, got it. Uh, okay, okay, got it, got it. Okay, um, I'm Tathakato Banerjee. First of all, thank uh, to Manhum Mahavirtalaya and the organizers, especially Dr. Monalisa Dibor and Dr. Parthasarthi Mondal uh, for giving me an opportunity to present. So today I will talk about nuclear reactions and the experimental observables. The contents will be like this. First, I will talk about the aims of nuclear physics, then a little bit about the history of nuclear physics, then classification of nuclear reactions and experimental observables. Then I will give an example of an exper experiment, how an experiment is performed the detection of reaction products and signal processing, and then the data analysis. The aims of nuclear physics were and are like this. Identify fundamental particles in nature, investigate the ultimate law of motion, describe the radioactivity and related phenomena, Understand basic properties of finite atomic nuclei. Explain interaction of nuclear radiation with matter. Understand fusion and fission reactions and their applications. To know different scales of interactions, forces. And finally, find the origin of the universe. Now coming to brief history of nuclear physics. Thinkers of the ancient world, most notably the Greek philosopher Democritus and the Indian sage Kanad had contemplated the corpuscular nature of matter. There was no serious work done with atomism from the time of Galen until Gassendian Descartes resurrected it in the 17th century. The gap between these two Modern naturalists and the ancient atomists mark the exile of the atom. In the history of Europe, the Middle Ages or medieval period lasted from the 5th to the late 15th century. It began with the fall of the Western Roman Empire and merged into the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. It is universally admitted that the Middle Ages had abandoned atomism and virtually lost it. The first signal from the subatomic world were received by the mankind when Becquerel discovered radioactivity in 1896. Two years later, Mary and Pierre Curie succeeded in separating 
a naturally occurring radioactive element radium from the ore pitch blend the pi pioneering alpha scattering experiment in 1909 uh, performed by hans geiger and ernest marsden under the guidance of arns uh, rutherford disproved the plum pudding model of um, proposed by jj thompson in 1897 the existence of a positively charged nucleus as a tiny central part of an atom was proposed niels bohr in 1913 proposed a model on the constitution of atoms and molecules in order to explain the stability of atom and the discrete wavelength observed in the spectra of light emitted from excited atoms the subatomic world was exposed to the mankind here i want to recall john dalton's atomic theory where he proposed uh, it was proposed in 183 1803 presently it is known that atoms cannot be destroyed or created in chemical reaction but in nuclear reactions so the essence of dalton's theory is still valid russian chemist dmitry ivanovich mendeleev introduced the first modern periodic table in 1869 earlier than 1928 scientists used to visualize the passage of ionizing radiation by cloud chamber rutherford used zinc sulfide as a fluorescent screen to detect in 1928 geiger, geiger muller counter was invented later in 1934 photomultiplier tube pmt was invented by ions and chasberg through though uh, enrico fermi could produce new transuranic element with the reaction of neutron induced on heavy nuclei it was han and strassman who discovered that the elements of much smaller atomic weight and charge are produced from the irradiation of uranium This happening was termed as fission by Meitner and Frisch in 1939. Bohr and Wheeler could explain fission theoretically, and Bohr's independence hypothesis on compound nucleus formation and decay came, which was later verified experimentally by Professor Samarendranath Gosal, S. N. Gosal. I think you have all read his book, right? Nuclear physics, atomic physics. so until 1968 most detection in particle physics uh, meant examining thousands of photographs from bubble or spark chambers flash tubes or scintillation counters to look for interesting tracks left behind from the debris of particle collisions which was time consuming and painstaking work also in 1968 George Charpak invented the Nobel Prize winning multiwave proportional chamber pushing particle physics detection into the electronic era to go deeper into the nucleus one needs more energy right side by side the developments were going on preparing accelerators the cockroach-walton um, accelerator is the prototype of an electrostatic accelerator The first belt charge electrostatic generator was developed by R.J. Van de Graaff. Here you can see this figure, Dr. Van de Graaff with his mm, generator, cascade generator. In 1931, the concept of tandem accelerator, this one. in order to achieve higher beam energies than with single ended van de graaff machines was first specifically proposed by benet and darby in 1936 and later 
The first practical application was made by the high voltage engineering company in a machine constructed for the Chalk River Laboratory and reported by Van de Graaff in 1960. In India, we have two such uh, main accelerators, uh, tandem accelerators, one at IUSC New Delhi from where I did my PhD and another at TIFR Mumbai. The early days of nuclear physics research were spent in looking at the ground state properties of the nuclei and studying the light and induced reactions. With the advent of new particle accelerators like linear accelerator, shortly LINAC by R. Withrow in 1928. Here is R. Withrow. Uh, in 1928, cyclotron by Ernest Lawrence in 1929. Here he is, the, he is uh, Professor Lawrence with his cyclotron, a small. Electron synchrotron by Edwin Macmillan in 1945. Proton in linear accelerator by Alvarez et al. 1946 and the availability of the heavy ion beams, other reaction processes could be studied. Here you can see this uh, atom bomb, um, which was uh, responsible for the uh, this mushroom cloud in Hiroshima in 1945. So now let me go to the next slide. Later I shall come back here again. So a little bit about uh, classic classification of nuclear reactions and experimental observables. Let us look at these two sets. The first ebb and flow of the relationship of two water droplets on a Colocasia gigantia leaf. This can be directly correlated with the Bohr-Wheeler fission theory on the basis of Gamow's famous liquid drop model. Set two will showcase the story of nuclear reaction. Elastic scattering is a purely electrostatic uh, interaction between two nuclei. The identities and the kinetic energies of the relative motion remains unchanged. The inelastic reaction is suggestive of a process where uh, the identities and the kinetic energies uh, are not un uh, unchanged. They change. And the Interact, um, part of this kinetic energy of the relative motion goes into the intrinsic excitation. In case of transfer reactions, one or more um, nucleons are transferred between the reacting nuclei. Nuclei can be stripped off the projectile and captured by the target nucleus or can be picked up from the target nucleus and captured by the projectile or can be knocked out but not captured and their particles scattered in the exit channel. In set two and one, a compound nucleus is formed every, where every degree of freedom is relaxed. Here you can see. This figure I made uh, when while I was doing my PhD, just to uh, make people easily understand <laughs> this fusion, fission and all. So, uh, in the compound nucleus, uh, what I was telling that every degree of freedom is relaxed and it has forgotten how it is formed. But it is now in an excited state, rich in energy and angular momentum. So it has to de-excite to come down to ground state. Is not it? Next, it comes to a point where uh, it has to take a decision for future, the saddle point. Saddle point. If there is a loss of level of autonomy between the attractive force, surface tension, and the repulsive force, Coulomb force, you all know, and repulsive for win, force wins, then the compound nucleus fissions into two fragments. Otherwise, neutron or light charge particle emission will occur to yield a cold evaporation residue shortly ER. Please remember this abbreviation ER, which is evaporation residue. But there are other fission-like processes which do not go via this fusion path, as I have 
that is depicted here and create hindrance to fusion to this process, this threat process. Just like your jealous neighbor, <laughs> the process in which a dinucleus system is formed, but this DNS does not evolve inside fission saddle point to form a compound nucleus and the system decays by subsequent fission and no ER, evaporation residue is formed, is called quasi fission. This is asymmetric quasi fission, which was discovered in 1985 here. 1985 by Toke et al. First fission occurs at high angular momentum where fission barrier vanishes. And it was discovered in 1981 by Bordieri et al. Other than this, a symmetric slow quasi fission also occurs which was mentioned by Zagrevive and Aritomo in around 2005 and experimentally verified by Hinde et al. in 2008. This, this man is Zagrevive at GINR, where I am now. So these are collectively called non-compound nuclear fission, NCNF, abbreviation again, please remember it, which causes fusion probability that is PCN, this is also an abbreviation, PCN to deviate from unity, okay. So again, coming back to the previous slide, in 2002, the super heavy element of uh, Z118, uh, Oganeson, was produced in Dubna, named after Professor Yuri Oganeson, the latest version of periodic table was released by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, on December 1st, 2018. It, it has seven completely failed periods or rows out of 118 known elements, 90 are found in nature. Everything on Earth and possibly in the universe, including us, is made up of the combination of these natural elements, remaining 28 elements are synthetic. So the heavy evaporation residue production cross-section can be factorized like this, where sigma capture is the capture cross-section related here at this stage, which we can get from some couple channel calculation. And P survival is the survival probability of the compound nucleus, which can be obtained from a statistical model nucleus. This stage is a survival probability, but this fusion probability PCN is the least known quantity. A major challenge in super heavy element formation is the presence of non-compound nuclear processes I have just mentioned here. So ultimately, we have to found or we have to identify these processes, this straight, which is following this straight one, these processes, and we have to um, uh, rule out all these possibilities, quasi fission events, fast fission events, symmetric quasi fission events, all these possibilities we have to rule out and finally get how much is the fusion fission by fusion probability, okay? So here, the intense vertical bands around uh, mass ratio 0.22 and mass ratio 0.78 are from elastic and quasi-elastic scattering of the projectile and target from obvious reasons. As time goes and sticking time of the projectile uh, with the target gets larger, more rearrangements take place. When the projectile completes one rotation, one ro rotation, the composite system enters into the fusion-fission region near mass ratio 0.5, right? Which is half of the mm, mass number of the compound nucleus. Asymmetric, um, in between these two ext extreme, this fusion-fission and quasi-elastic and qu this quasi-fission region is there. Asymmetric coefficient results in mass angle correlation in the mass angle distribution. See here in this uh, figure for 
12 carbon induced on lead reaction, the mass angle distribution is straight, right? Around 0.5, mass ratio 0.5, this is straight. And mass distribution also is reproduced by the uh, theoretical calculation expected for fusion fission. There is no tilting also, right? No correlation and consequently, the mass distribution is also perfectly Gaussian. But as we go to the heavier projectile, induced reaction, non-compound nuclear fission coming into picture, making the mass angle distribution tilted, mass distribution asymmetric. The ratio of reduced uh, evaporation residue cross-sections, where one of these reaction is having fusion probability one, that means all events are going to fusion fission, right? The straight path. I can also reveal about the amount of non-compound nuclear fission processes. As you can see here, for 16 oxygen induced on late reaction, this is fusion probability one. And as we go to the heavier projectile, this ER cross-section, reduced ER cross-section are less, right? By analyzing the shape of the angular distribution and comparing it with the prediction from uh, rotating liquid drop model, also one can understand the presence of fusion hindrance. Okay, now let us uh, look at the experimental observables of some reactions and understand the signatures of diff different physical processes. First, take an example of light projectile, 16 oxygen, induced on a spherical target. 204 lead. Okay. Here the evaporation residue, ER and fission cross sections, ER gated proton and alpha multiplicities are reproduced by statistical model. Okay. Mass distribution is perfectly Gaussian. Okay. And there is no mass angle correlation. This is straight, not tilt. The fission fragment angular anisotropy is reproduced by statistical saddle point model calculation. So we can call, conclude that there is only fusion fission events for these reactions. If you ask that where this elastic events has gone, elastic events are generally deselected while doing analysis. So next take an example of a heavy projectile uh, uh, no, this is 16 oxygen again. Um, light projectile induced on a deformed new actinide target. Earlier it was a spherical target, lead, do not fall lead. Now, same projectile, 16 oxygen on a deformed actinide target, 238 uranium. The reproduced, here also the air cross section is reproduced, barrier distribution as well. Mass distribution is also Gaussian. There is no mass angle correlation also here. So these observables say that there is no uh, uh, quasi fusion, only fusion vision, right? But unlike the previous example, this anisotropy, here you can see the angular anisotropy, fission fragment angular anisotropy is not reproduced by statistical saddle point model calculation. This is only reproduced by dynamical model calculation. So hence we can conclude here that some amount of non-compound nuclear fission is present here. That may be some symmetric coefficient. Next, take an example of a heavy projectile, sulfur, on a deformed actinide target, thorium or uranium. Here you can see, unlike the previous cases, even mass energy distribution are showing signatures of asymmetric coefficient, right? This part is for asymmetric coefficient. This is for fusion fission. This kind of signatures was not there before in previous cases. Okay. These are elastics. These are elastics. So, Fusion cross-sections are less than the capture cross-section here, this uh, black continuous solid lines. Uh, capture, this is 
less than the capture cross section there is mass angle correlation in the um, mass distribution mass angle distribution mass distribution widths are higher than that what is expected uh, for fusion fission or from that of 16 oxygen induced reaction this is for sulfur induced reaction so this is higher more higher and not linear not having linear dependence with energy also right so we can conclude here <coughs> that there are asymmetric quasi fusion events transfer induced fusion events okay and symmetric slow quasi fusion events then how to get rid of um, transfer induced fusion events if people ask me uh, to get this fusion fusion events only so recently we have published one paper there we have worked on this problem actually so in this figure this is the velocity distribution fission source velocity distribution in the angular range of 95 degree to 105 degree so in the fission source velocity distribution plots at same e by vb of three reaction 16 oxygen on 244 plutonium 12 carbon on 248 curium and 9 beryllium on 249 californium boundaries for specific transfer reaction can be seen right this circles of different types for 16 oxygen and 12 carbon induced reactions the binary events and the three body transfer induced fission events are separated right they are separated one can put a small circular gate here to get only this binary fission product products fission fission products but this is not the case for nine beryllium induced on 249 california there is a uh, lot of overlap right between this fusion fission three binary events and three body events so so how to how to do that so one can apply successively molar circular cards and look at the ratios of mass spectra in the outer annulus magenta to those of the inner circle blue as a function of mass ratio around a radius of 0.3 mm per nanosecond as you can see here this ratio becomes independent of mass indicating that these spectra are essentially not influenced by the transfer fission anymore so here we can conclude that if we put a circular gate of radius 0.30 mm per nanosecond in the fission source velocity distribution then we can say that around 80% or more than 90% fusion fusion events we can get okay so now i'll give a simple example of an exam experiment how it is performed and all so by now you know a little bit of history of nuclear physics and specifically nuclear fission and have got idea about different types of nuclear reactions and their signatures different experimental observables now we shall look at a simple experiment how it is performed how analysis is done etc thin durable uniform isotopic targets first we have to get such target nuclear target thin target or onto which we will uh, put the accelerator beam okay so for that thin durable uniform isotopic target sub 193 iridium 187 rhenium 182 tungsten 181 tantalum 175 lutetium and 169 thulium of thickness around 80 mili microgram per centimeter square 60 microgram per centimeter square, 70 microgram per centimeter and 175 microgram per centimeter square 110 microgram per centimeter square and 270 microgram per centimeter square respectively have been fabricated on carbon backing by physical vapor deposition 
technique for nuclear reaction studies at Inter University Accelerator Center, IUSC, New Delhi. Preparation of very thin silk supporting targets of these elements is non reproducible. A carbon backing thickness of around 22 microgram per centimeter square was achieved. For the targets of refractory metals, iridium, rhenium, tungsten, tantalum, egon evaporation was used. The lanthanide targets, lutetium, thulium, were fabricated using egon. Um, for carbon backing, resistive heating, for source material deposition, and egon evaporation for natural carbon capping. So, for this um, lanthanide targets, we have two carbon uh, layers. One is backing and one is capping. So, use of annealed natural carbon coated uh, glass slides instead of self supporting natural carbon foils directly as a substrate during evaporation here and post post growth annealing increase the survivability of the targets the anneal slides were first export, exposed to warm water vapor, then droplets of the water were dropped carefully at the top of the edge of the slide and made to pass underneath the film. These two tricks helped in detaching the bottom of the film from the glass side. Floating of the films became relatively easier after that. The targets were characterized for purity and thicknesses were measured and compared using different techniques. Okay, RBS, rather for backscattering, X-ray diffraction, X-ray and profilometer. No high jet contamination is found. You can see the peaks of the respective elements. So these are the high, highlights. So we, we got a target. Now we can proceed to the next step. An accelerated beam in vacuum on a target, right? So the electron of IUSC New Delhi is installed in a vertical configuration in an insulating tank of height 26.5 meter and diameter 5.5 meter. The tank is filled with uh, sulfur hexafluoride gas at seven PSI pressure. Low energy negative ions are produced in the multi-cathode source of negative ions by cesium sputtering, abbreviation SNIC source, housed at the top of the accelerator. It is a sputter ion source capable of delivering an anions from almost all elements expect, uh, except noble gases by bombarding it with cesium plus ions. Being tandem accelerator, two-stage acceleration is achieved for any given terminal voltage here. The entire accelerator is computer controlled and is operated from a centralized control room. The accelerated beam from the electron is then switched to any one of the seven beam lines using the switching magnet. In our case, this is the general purpose scattering chamber GPC. Okay. For the verific further verification and deeper understanding of fusion probability, an experiment was performed in this general purpose scattering chamber facility of IOSC. A 28 silicon beam was bombarded onto six targets to populate composite systems in pre-actinide regions. Fission fragments are detected by nine hybrid telescope detectors, each consisting of a delta E gas detector and E silicon detector. The first detection layer of such detector is composed of a transmission type isobutane gas detector. This layer gives the nucleus identification capability. It has a central anode sandwiched between two cathodes. The electrodes are mounted with their plane perpendicular to the direction of the incoming particle. The second and final detection layer is the silicon PIPS detectors. Detector, the gas IC and silicon detector are housed inside a cylindrical stainless steel, SSTU. The signals are extracted using hermetically sealed BNC feed through mounted on the back or exit flange of the chamber. 
Out of these six telescopes were mounted on the upper arm covering the backward angle 60 degree to 170 degree while the other three telescopes are mounted on the lower arm covering the forward angles 41 degree to 70 degree. Pressure of isobutane gas in all the delta E detectors was kept constant and 74 millibar. and 0.9 micrometer mylar was used as a center foil. The experimental arrangement is shown here. The trigger of the data acquisition system was generated using the OR, logical OR of the timing signal from the all E and delta E detectors. Two monitor detectors were kept at plus minus 10 degree for positioning beam on the target and normalization of cross section. A preamplifier, this is the signal processing the circuit simple in a simplified manner a preamplified amplify weak signals i think you all have read uh, weak signals from a detector and does impedance matching between the detector with high impedance and the rest of the circuit of low impedance as we have used a semiconductor detector we have we used here a charge sensitive preamplifier to integrate the charge carried by the incoming pulse on the capacitor. An amplifier further amplifies a signal coming from the preamplifier. However, it has other properties also, such as a high signal to noise ratio to provide good energy resolution, large bandwidth to provide fast timing characteristics. It provides provision for pulse shipping also. A peak sensing CAMAC. ADC, analog to digital converter, converts the maximum voltage of an analog signal to equivalent digital signals. For example, successive um, approximation method, by successive approximation method. Compared to other devices, this is a slow, slower device. So now, post-processing of the experimental data. So we need a pro computer program to extract information such as angle, energy, event number, etc. Mm, literature review we have already done then observe the data and data analysis so this is the next step the measured fission fragment angular distributions were transformed from the laboratory to the center of mass frame using viola systematic for symmetric fission the differential fission cross-section were fitted with this exact quantum mechanical expression okay the experimental fission cross-section were obtained by integrating measured differential fission cross sections. This is the fission fragments, fission fragment events. Okay, these are other processes. Obtained by integrating measured differential fission cross sections, the experimental anisotropies are obtained from the ratio, from the ratio of uh, 180 degree means uh, partial cross section at the 180 degree and at 90 degree. Statistical saddle point model also gives an isotropy. This is theoretical calculation. Approximate, ex approximate, approximate expressions are, goes like this. In our work, we adopted Tajima's expression for this um, differential fission cross section fitting. That's for information. We observe that the experimental anisotropy exceeds the calculation. This is the this is the calculation for this particular reaction. This raw lines and these are the experimental data. So near BB, okay, in Coulomb barrier in all the reactions except the ones involving targets with large non-zero ground state spin that is 175 lutetium and 180 tantalum. These targets are having large ground state spin. Instead of these uh, uh, targets, for the other reactions, we are getting the enhancement here. We are observing. Okay. So fission cross sections are calculated. So integrating integrating this uh, differential fission cross sections for all angles, we get the total fission cross section. Okay, now it is time to compare it with some standard theoretical model, statistical model. Okay, we compared it with two. 
So fission cross sections are calculated using PACE 3 where no cell correction was applied and found to match with this orange line, continuous line, found to match with the measured cross section. We also performed calculation with a statistical model called VEXTAT. For your information, uh, I can tell you this VEXTAT was developed at VCC, Variable Energy Cyclotron Center, uh, Kolkata. So this VEXTAT uh, uh, was not having cell effect in ground state level density of parameter and cell correction in uh, cell correction in fission barrier. These uh, two are employed in the VEXTAT. Okay. In this case, calculated cross sections are found to be significantly lower than the measured ones in all systems expect, except the 28 silicon induced on 181 tantalum and 182 tungsten. For these two, both the um, calculation, both the prediction, theoretical prediction reproduce the uh, experimental data. But for other systems, you can see there is a difference. In this black line which is from Bextat. Okay, so that means that in our opinion the effect of fusion probability is neglected altogether where, um, where people scale down the theoretical prediction from statistical model just to uh, at hand means uh, on an ad hoc basis just to reproduce the data. For, for for those uh, many many uh, group many group do that, but that is on an ad hoc basis as for our opinion. On one hand, experimental anisotropy near the Coulomb barrier exceed the calculation, thus hinting at the presence of NCNF, right? NCNF on compound nuclear fission processes. On the other hand, both models reproduce the fission cross-section, experimental fission cross-section with or without the inclusion of cell correction, revealing no significant presence of non-compound nuclear fission in these reactions in the range of uh, lab energy considered in this work. So study with other experimental probes and calculation by switchable dynamical model may reveal the extent of non-compound nuclear fission processes in such cases. So after doing all this from this experiment, we can conclude what fission fragment angular distributions are obtained for six systems, populating the comp composite systems, uh, 197 bismuth, 204 polonium, 203 astatine, 208, uh, Rn209 francium210 radium respectively at center of mass energy near the Coulomb barrier experimental anisotropy exceeds the statistical predictions except for the reaction involving the targets having non large non-zero ground state spin onset of non-compound nuclear processes in the preactinide region preactinide nuclei was verified which was our actual um, aim of the of doing this experiment, right? This transition happens in this preactinate mass region. Experimental anisotropy is increasingly deviated from statistical model prediction as one moved from preactinate to actinate. Okay, these are the conclusion. So now I end my talk here. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Tata. Mm -hmm. uh, now the session is open for uh, discussion. Now I request all the participants, please do feel free to ask anything regarding this. Now the session is open. Hello, I think no one is <laughs> right now is, uh... hello. Okay. Mm. okay, so anyone, anyone is interested for anything, please do ask. 
please please uh, feel free don't think that you are posting and one thing is that uh, we will provide uh, please do provide your mail ids i mean i request all the speakers in the chat box so that uh, if they have any query they can directly mail yeah, you regarding sure, sure. Sure, Please, sure. Uh, all the speaker, I request all the speaker to provide their mail IDs into the chat box. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, no more uh, questions is there. Let us thank the speaker. Thank you, Tathagat, for the uh, wonderful talk and very informative. I hope uh, participants will get benefited from your talk. And uh, as I uh, said earlier, that if they have any queries, they can directly mail you. Please provide your okay. mail ID in the chat okay. box. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tata. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ryan Kumar. Ek. Ryan is here? Yes, yes. Yes, Monal. Okay. 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 So, uh, let us have a brief discussion introduction of Ryan. Uh, Dr. Ryan Kumar uh, is currently uh, serves as assistant professor at uh, Cochin uh, University of Science and Technology, Kerala. He has done his B.Sc. and M.Sc. from Kannur University, Kerala. Then he did his doctorate degree from IIT Roorkee. After that, he joined as a postdoctorate fellow at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which is TIFR Mumbai. Then he got a position as assistant professor at NIT Suratkal also. Then he has served his position for a few months, I think. And uh, Dr. Ryan Kumar has published many papers in many prestigious journals. And he has a, also an awardee of best thesis. Uh, I think it's a uh, nuclear physicist are well, very well known of this DAE, Department of Atomic Energy Symposium. He has got the best thesis award. So Ryan, uh, his main area of research is the giant dipole resonance. So um, therefore, he, he, he will uh, deliver his talk in some different aspect, but uh, he's a very good theoretician. So now I share the screen to Ryan. Ryan, please hand over. Take over it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Monalisha. So I hope it's uh, I'm audible to you. You are audible, Ryan. Yeah. So. So is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Yes. It is yes, visible. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So our audience will be mainly from uh, BSc students, isn't it, Monalisha? Dr. Monalisha? Yeah, I have kept it like that. So okay, okay. mainly for the students, the undergraduates and graduate students mainly. Mainly. Okay, 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 okay. So, so good afternoon to all. So I'll be talking about the importance of nuclear energy for sustainable development. So yeah, before start, uh, thank you, Dr. Monalisha, for this nice introduction. So presently, I'm working at Department of Physics, Cochin University of Science and Technology, Cochin in Kerala. So this is just a, a start, starting slide where I thought that I can Introduce, include this slide here. So in 1996, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, it was awarded to three gentlemen. So for their discovery of fullerenes. So fullerenes means it's a carbon 60. So there are 60 carbons and which forms a, a structure like this, football like structure, okay? So it has a lot of applications are there. Uh, so we are not looking into these details, but the one among this particular, this Richard Samley, this fellow. So in one conference, he made some, uh, he presented his, uh, some work there and he discussed about the future global energy prosperity, the tetrawatt challenge. So it was in 2004. So basically uh, this person, 
introduced or discussed about the humanity's top 10 problems for this for the next 50 years so what are they so he listed it in this way where energy is in the first position then water food environment pollutions uh, property uh, poverty uh, terrorism and war disease education democracy then population something like this so the first phase is for energy so it, he mentioned it in such a way that if we have enough energy then we can solve almost all the remaining problems so if we have energy we can yeah so if someone uh, in some other area where there are a lot of access of water we can pump it from there to some and uh, necessary some scarcity some desert type places or food also and environment so in that way we have energy then we can solve most of the other problems okay so if we uh, know the present situation in 2018 and uh, this this is from 2018 reports so we know that the most of our energy is coming from fossil fuels basically which create a lot of which generate a lot of uh, greenhouse gases also so we can see that the coal is uh, mainly it's uh, represented by this uh, this shade so you can see that uh, this uh, this is the year wise 19 and uh, 2000 2001 like that up to 2017 okay so you can see that the uh, we are mainly depending on these fossil fuels, mainly this coal and oil, which is uh, shown with this green color. Then renewable or nuclear energy, all these things are contributing a little bit to this total consumption of energy. Okay, so this is the world consumption. So it's in a million, uh, it's is equivalent to million ton oil equivalent. So that's what's shown here. So then idle electricity, which is shown with this blue, blue color, and it's also not contributing much, mainly from fossil fuels only, okay? So if you just look into uh, this fuel consumption by regions, so these different colors represent different continent or different regions like Asia specific, Africa, then North America is represented by this green, light green color. So when you just look into this, uh, this coal, uh, this uh, bar only, you can see that most of the coal, it's, uh, it's mainly used in this Asia specific region. And we are using a very little bit. Uh, so, but uh, US, you can see that uh, in US, the, uh, the coal, it's, uh, they are using not much. It's just a, uh, maybe it's a very low, uh, very minimum amount only. But uh, when we compare with some other places like in nuclear energy, you can see that North, North America using uh, most of its energy from nuclear fuel and uh, uh, our Asia specific where India is also a part, uh, we are using uh, less nuclear energy. Okay, so this is just a, a details about this uh, different fuels like oils, natural gas, coal, and nuclear energy, hydroelectricity, electricity, and renewable energy, how they are uh, utilized in different areas of our globe. Okay. So this is again a one uh, another type of representation. It's okay. Yeah. So if we just look into this world electricity production by this was 2016. Uh, so you can see that the 38 percentage is mainly from coal and 23 percentage of world electricity generation production is from gas. So mainly these fossil fuels, it will cover more than 50 percentage, okay? More than 50 percentage of our electricity generation, which will generate a lot of greenhouse gases and which will lead to uh, global warming and global dimming, a lot of issues, okay? But in nuclear, Energy is only a 10 percentage of total energy, and we have some 5.6 percent from solar, wind, and geothermal and tidal energies, and 3.7 percent from oil, and so some other uh, renewable or uh, methods are also there. Okay, but you can say that more than 50 percentage is from these fossil fuels. 
Okay, so now we are looking for some other alternative how this nuclear can be, nuclear energy can be utilized for this purpose. So I hope all of you are familiar with this particular periodic table of elements. So we have now 118 elements are there. Okay, so this is organoson, uh, which was discovered recently. So we have 118 elements are there. So here we know that we are placing these atoms in the increasing order of its atomic atomic number. So okay, here you can say that hydrogen, helium, and like that. So recently, this zirconium, moscovium, and tennessee organoson. These four uh, new elements were discovered recently, and its uh, names are also given very recently. I hope all of you are aware of those things. So this is in the case of atoms. But when you look into nucleus, so before that, so if you just look into our universe, we can see that if we arrange the different subjects in physics, we can arrange them as a, or uh, in science, it can arrange, it can be arranged in the form of a quantum ladder. See, if you are talking about clusters or galaxy, then star, planet, then living organisms are there. Its size is reducing, okay? Cells are there, then materials, different molecules are there. Molecules are made up of atoms, then atoms, inside the atom we have atomic nuclei. So if we provide some more energy, we can say we can look at these baryons and mesons and quarks inside that a proton and neutron. We have quarks are there. So even if you provide some more amount of energy, we can see these uh, strings and this type of, uh, uh, some theories are already, already there, but actually it's, uh, till now it's, uh, we couldn't detect those things, but yeah. So now we can arrange in this manner. So you can see that atomic nuclear, which is in the, almost in the middle of this particular quantum ladder. So this is how we arrange this. So, th so there is always an importance for atomic nucleus. Okay, so in, uh, periodic table, we arrange atoms in the increasing order of atomic number and atomic mass. Here we can say that the nucleus can be arranged in, in this manner where you have in x-axis neutrons and y-axis protons are arranged. This is known as nuclear chart. Okay, so these uh, different blocks are different colors are there and you can see that these dark blocks, these are the stable most stable uh, nuclei are uh, represented with these black blocks. Then uh, here we have something called some boundary of trip line and boundary of this nuclear chart is there, which is known as trip line. So in the case of, uh, in this side, in this neutron side, we can say this is the neutron trip line. In the case of protons, we can say them as proton trip lines. That means, Beyond that, this is a theoretical prediction. Uh, these lines are obtained by the theoretical predictions. So we can say that beyond that line, there will not be any existence of nucleus. Okay, that means nucleus uh, can be formed with these protons and neutrons. So these protons and neutrons are arranged or attached, uh, hold together by a nuclear force. So there will be a situation when you cannot hold the nucleons and nucleons. That means when you cannot hold protons and neutrons together with this nuclear force. So in that case, the nucleus will not be formed. So that's the portion, that's the limit, limit of existence of a nucleus. So that's, that's represented by this particular trip lines. So if we, if we have a, a nucleus with a equal number of protons and neutrons, so now we are adding, adding lot of protons inside that. So the proton number will be increasing. So if I have something here, I will increase the number of protons. It will go up and up, up like this. But at, after some time, I cannot add number of more number of neutrons because it will not hold in that uh, particular nucleus. The same way if I add a number of neutrons, so it will be go like this, like this. And it, it will reach a point where I cannot add a more number of neutrons into that particular system, okay? So that points are known as a drip lines. So this is all about protons and neutron drip lines. So if I just look into this 
a chart. Uh, earlier, uh, we have some idea. There are different techniques uh, by which these different neutron, uh, different nuclei, uh, nuclei were discovered. So, in the earlier cases, we can say that only the radioactivity is the uh, radioactivity case, the only one uh, source where how we can detect these uh, protons and neutrons, or where we how we can detect the nucleus. So. As the time increases, we can say that uh, different experimental facilities were developed. So that's what we presented here. So initially it was by the radioactive decay only, but as time increases, different experimental facilities developed and different techniques were uh, involved in this uh, process. So you can find this thing in YouTube also. So. Uh, so this is how uh, in each year uh, how these uh, protons and neutrons were uh, nucleus were dis discovered. So basically, in experiments, people discover uh, people uh, generate discover these protons and uh, discover this new nucleus. So that's what arranged in this periodic table also because you know that without the nucleus there will not be any atom or anything. So the people, as uh, the scientists, discover nucleus. So that nucleus is arranged in this uh, periodic table, okay? So if we just uh, look into this nucleus, we can say that uh, we have in center, we have a nucleus and surroundings, we have protons and neutrons are there. So this is just a, in Rutherford experiments, alpha particles were bombarding. Mm -hmm. So that's what is just shown in here. So when you discuss about protons and neutrons or nucleus, we can say that atom, it has a dimension of 10 raised to minus 10 meters, okay? And nucleus is 10 raised to minus 14 meters. And inside that nucleus, we have nucleons, which are of the range of 10 raised to minus 15 meters. And inside these protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons are known as nucleons, from mainly we can say nucleons. So inside these protons and neutrons, we have quarks, quarks are also there, but we are not looking into these things. And I just want to uh, to show this the dimension how small they are so that's that's the only my intention here okay so now we are uh, going to some uh, other area so normally when we hear about something like nucleus radiation radio isotope and radioactivity something like this so people will have a speculation and they just uh, don't go into the other details and we just uh, so move away from that particular topics that's normally happening in our case but there are a lot of applications are there so nuclear fission it can be used for this energy generation in healthcare there are in cancer treatment and there are different types of uh, nuclear isotopes and traces are used for uh, in healthcare uh, department and in industries also it's uh, nuclear isotopes are using and in agriculture and food technology, there are different food items where uh, high yielding crops were uh, developed with this uh, nuclear radiation or mutation processes and radioactive carbon dating is there, element analysis is there. So these are different types of applications are there. So now we will just look into this aspect only, the nuclear energy for mm, nuclear fission for nuclear energy generations, okay? So in normal case, a nuclear fission. So that's what we consider here. So here, a nuclear fission means, okay, I have a nucleus. So if it is splitting into two, so I have a initial one nucleus is there. It's splitting into two different small nucleus. Okay, two nuclei. So one initial particle, initial nucleus is it is splitting into two. But when you add the uh, energy of this fission fragments, that means the, the new products. So initial one nucleus is there. So it's now it's splitting into two fragments and some neutrons are also produced. So if I add the mass of this particular uh, nucleus and, sorry, yeah. If I add the uh, uh, mass of this particular nuclei, a nucleus and this nucleus along with these three neutrons, I will not get the equal mass of my initial nucleus. That means parent nucleus. So one parent nucleus is there. It's splitting into two. It's splitting into two fission fragments. 
and uh, three neutrons. But if I add the mass of all these uh, fission fragments and neutrons, it will not be equal to the mass of an initial nucleus. So there will be a, a change in this mass. Some mass is missing. So that mass is converted into energy. That means that mass mass into C square. So it will give the, the it will generate the, some energy. Its amount is something around 200 MeV mega electron volt. So in in the case of nuclear fission, so normally one uranium 235 nucleus is there. So we are colliding, we are colliding that particular nucleus with a neutron. So with this energy of this neutron, this nucleus uranium 235, it will be now in excited state, it will break into two fission fragments along with the three neutrons and some energy is also generated. So this is known as nuclear fission, where initial mass is split, initial nucleus is splitting into two fission fragments. Okay. So we are utilizing, trying to utilize this particular amount of energy which is produced in this process. So why we are looking for this nucleus? Because when you consider one uranium fuel pellet, its energy, which is generating an energy, which is equivalent to a one ton coal or 149 gallons of oil or one 1,700 cubic feet of pit gas. So its amount of energy generated by one uranium pellet is so high. So now we are looking into the process. So in normal case, in nuclear reactors, reactors means it's a place where we can utilize this nuclear fission process, we can control this nuclear fission process uh, and generate the energy. So where um, one neutron is there, it's colliding uranium-235, so it's splitting into krypton and barium, three neutrons are generating. So these three neutrons again will collide with some other, other uranium atom, it will again generate some energy. So this is the process, how this energy is generating. So I have one neutron is there, it will, after this reaction, it will generate three neutrons. These three neutrons will collide with the three other uranium. It will again generate uh, nine neutrons. So like that. So this process is known as nuclear chain reactions. So we have to do it in a controlled manner inside a nuclear reactor. Okay. So in one reaction, you have 200 MeV energy is there. So, but in the second step, you can see that it's 800 and it's a very huge amount of energy is there. So we can just look into this particular case, how this nuclear uh, reactor works. OK, 
okay so i hope it's uh, clear for everyone um dr monalisha yes so yes can... okay okay yeah so i can see some chats where someone can't hear anything from virendra ranka virendra ranka yeah okay maybe some network issues okay so when we look into this uh, the nuclear uh, share of electric electricity generation in 2017 you can see that in case in france their total energy uh, the 70 percentage of their energy is generated from nuclear power okay then ukraine so so all these uh, in all these countries it's uh, more, more than 40 percentage is generating from this nuclear power only but in our india it's very 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 less so we are just uh, generating some two or three percentage of our total electricity from this nuclear nuclear power so there are different uh, nuclear reactors are under or, uh, operation so in united states uh, in total we can say that 4453 nuclear reactors are operating and in usa a lot number of a more number of nuclear reactors are there in france china russia it's like this so there are a lot of nuclear reactors are under construction so in that list we can see china is constructing more something around 11 nuclear reactors are under construction and india is also constructing more around seven in new reactors russia and like this so i just want to men show this highlight this the number of reactors generated under construction in india okay it's around some seven new, new nuclear reactors are under construction so if we just look into the the world scenario uh, there are um, a lot of countries are uh, generating their energy from uh, nuclear reactions or nuclear power so that's what shown with this uh, green color where you can see that there are some dark green is in some areas and but uh, most of these countries are generating energy from this nuclear power so if we just look into uh, in our case in, in india we can say that uh, total gener uh, electricity generation in our country during 2017 18 it's like 1308 billion units so out of that 4.8 billion units were imported from bhutan and 102 from uh, renewable energy sources so why we are giving some importance for this nuclear power? Because we can say that in one sense it's clean and and it's a long lifetime around some 40 to 60 years reliable. And once it's uh, okay, you can say that for reactors it's very costly. But when you uh, once it's constructed, then we can say it will be providing electricity for 24 into 7 years uh, all the time and with a low cost energy we can generate low cost energy. And in India, there are uh, three different uh, program stages of a nuclear uh, product, energy production. Is there? Uh, we have three stage uh, programs are there in India. So, in one sense, we can say that this nuclear power is clean, green, and it's environment friendly. It's not generating any greenhouse gases. Okay. So, in our case, we can say uh, we are also generating or producing more energy from coal, gas, and fuels uh, fuel from these fossil fuels only and in nuclear it's generating only some 6780 megawatt uh, megawatt uh, energy only so it's just a two percentage of our total energy production in india so we can say that this thermal basically coal and gas diesel which contributes more more than 64 percentage uh, of our total energy generation okay so in India, this Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited (NPCIL), which is basically taking or at, uh, have a, which has an administrative control, uh, which is a uh, public sector, it's under the administrative control of Department of Atomic Energy. Uh, basically, they are controlling or operating all these nuclear reactors, and we have something 22 commercial nuclear reactors are there, which has a capacity of. Uh, which is uh, installed capacity of 6,780 
megawatt electricity. So uh, different reactors are there, which is working under this, which with uh, this boiled uh, water reactors or pressurized heavy water reactors, different reactors are there uh, based on their working technology. And we can categorize it like this, okay? So these are the present situation in operating reactors are 22 reactors are there. So in each reactor, this uh, each react it has a capacity, total capacity of 6,780, but there are some ongoing projects are also there. So it will be generating some 6,200 megawatt in near future. And there are some sanctioned projects are also, which are presently under pre-project activities, which will we are aiming to generate something like 9,000 megawatt from those uh, sanctioned projects also. So we are hoping in, in the near future we can uh, generate something like this. So, but at present we are generating only this much of uh, electricity from nuclear power. Okay. So these are the different uh, nuclear reactors uh, operating reactors in different places. So in Tarapur, uh, Rajasthan, Madras, and Aurora. Tarapur. So there are different uh, atomic energy uh, and nuclear reactors are there. So if we just look into this thing, we can say that in more, most of all, uh, most of the states, uh, we have these nuclear reactors and in each nuclear power generating stations, they ha we have different units. So recently in Kodangulam also started this uh, nuclear energy production. So most of the time uh, we can see that the people uh, discuss about the uh, nuclear reactor and its safety aspects. But we can see that we have a lot of a number of nuclear reactors in India, which has crossed, which has uh, continuously uh, operated for more than, um, I think more than three, uh, two or more than three, years, uh, I think more than two years, basically. So here it says that uh, this is more than 370 days. Uh, so it was running continuously more than one year in all these cases. So these new, uh, nuclear reactors were running continuously for more than one year. And there are some nuclear reactors which uh, operated continuously more than two years also. So uh, our safety and maintenance is uh, it's improved a lot. So we are now, we have a very good technology there. And, and now uh, the situation is that even India has set a world record by running a Kaikar reactor for more than some 900 days. So I will show you, I will show those details also. So when you just see the generation of this uh, nuclear energy in different years, it's uh, going like this. So its capacity is something like this. So in each years, we are trying to improve or increase the energy generation from this nuclear power. So you can see that in nuclear, uh, this is a Keika reactor. So which has set a world record by continuous, uh, continuous operation of 940 days of continuous operation. And earlier this record was for this uh, for the United Kingdom. So but on 2018, December 10, and then India has surpassed this, this record. And now uh, this, uh, so after that, they closed it for maintenance. So basically now the technology is changing and India is also, India is also uh, generating a lot of energy and maintenance and all these things are, if there is no any other, issues or a natural disaster or something like that. So we can run all these things without any problems also. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, now the session is open for discussion. Uh, hello, Ryan, I'm Chiranjeev. Hi, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I I want to know particularly one thing because uh, when I came here, uh, because uh, France is generating a lot of nuclear power as you have also shown in your uh, presentation, and but they are struggling to to manage the the the, the nuclear waste because uh, I think they have 
started to plan actually close some of its power plants because of this uh, problem because now uh, when more and more countries are producing more uh, nuclear powers we do not know how to handle this uh, nuclear waste because unlike even fossil fuel i mean this is going to stay for millions of years some of them the nuclear waste in india we have any plan to to handle that yeah uh, so uh, basically uh, normally uh, in india also we have some three different plants are there basically so they will try to keep it and concentrate it and contain for uh, many years so depending on its lifetime half lifetime so if they can able to convert into some uh, some um, if they can decrease that lifetime then they will try to dilute and uh, dispose so that's another method so there are basically depending on its uh, half life time so sometimes they will keep it in one place there will be some storage place uh, so they will con- concentrate it and contain it for a long time so after long years they will uh, they can dispose it so normally the nuclear waste it's, it has something like 22 20, 11 uh, 15 to 20 or 25 years uh, half life can be there in most of these uh, fission products so if there is something more than that they will concentrate and contain in some places there will be some areas like that but if there are some nuclear waste which they can dispose it by dilute and dispose it that's another method they normally follow so in in fukushima also you can see in certain uh, newspapers you can see that they have concentrated and contained in different boxes a different tanks where the uh, they store all those nuclear waste there so there are different methods like this so normally in jays also following three different methods like concentrate and contain dilute and dispose then one more is the you know, i missed it yeah so there are three methods are there for this nuclear waste disposal so in some other, some countries they keep it for a long time and in deep water deep sea they sometimes they uh, dispose it like that also but yes that's a, that's that's the only main issue in this particular field no because uh, because i i have i was also attending another seminar and there they were discussing uh, those new type of reactors where instead of uh, running a single fuel they iso they, they they locate a chain of nuclei where most of them are uh, radioactive and they are trying to design uh, fission processes followed by one after another so that you do not need to dispose your biofuel you can you can actually generate the fuel from the burning of the previous uh, previous nuclear yeah. yes, uh, yes, yes those kind of those kind of initiatives are there in india you have any idea yeah 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 basically in india also in nuclear power generation there are three different uh, stages of programs are there so in first one is basically based on this uranium and in second case we can say this is the breeder reactors where which uh, which will uh, generate more energy more nuclear fuel than it consumes so that's what i think you mentioned so so people are working in this in kodang uh, not in kodang uh, basically this uh, igcr indira gandhi uh, which is in uh, tamil nadu igcr so there uh, we have a breeder reactor so basically it will uh, so initially we are providing some nuclear fuel but after this nuclear reactions it will generate a more fuel and which will feed back this nuclear reaction so it will be a continuous cycle of reactions and which will generate a low amount of nuclear waste and there are some other type of rea- uh, nuclear programs are also in india where the most of this uh, energy generation it will be mainly from uh, thorium basically we have a lot of thorium content in sea co- uh, coastal areas of india so india is also trying to develop some uh, nuclear reactors with the, which can utilize this thorium and uh, basically from this monocyte and uh, monocyte ores so different uh, stages are uh, there so mainly i think this nuclear breeder reactors it will it will be a, it will be generating a lot amount of nuclear waste and so i think that's what uh, people are thinking and in, in different places it's continuing also but but in france they have i think uh, they have followed the earlier uh, they are the country which installed a lot of nuclear reactors and which were developed much years ago so so presently i think they are trying to convert it into 
this a new type of uh, methods where they can reduce this nuclear waste by continuous cycle of reactions i hope yeah i think it okay thank you any more question okay if no more question is there let us thank the speaker thank you rain for the wonderful uh, speech yeah thank please you. do thank provide you. please do provide uh, your mail id in the chat box yeah. so that yeah. interested participant can contact you yeah okay if they have thank any query thank okay thank okay. you thank you yeah yeah bye so our next speaker is dr chiranjeev mondal um <laughs> Chiranjeev, are you there? I am here. I am here. So, uh, Chiranjeev is here. So, let's uh, have a brief introduction about Chiranjeev. Dr. Chiranjeev Mondal has done his B.Sc. from Ramakrishna Mission Vidyalay, Nandapur. He did his M.Sc. from Calcutta University. Then, uh, his doctorate degree from Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata. Now, uh, Chiranjeev is a research scientist at University de Conne, Normandy, France. So, now I request Dr. Chiranjeev Pondal to share the screen. Please, Chiranjeev, take. Thank you. So, you, you can you can hear me? It's perfectly fine. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, good morning. from uh, from here i think it's already afternoon there so good afternoon everybody and thank you dr deva for inviting me for this uh, for this talk and i also apologize for my initial disruption of the internet connection so now everything is fixed i think you can hear me properly so uh, this is a bit difficult to give a give a talk in uh, in this online platform because i cannot see anybody and i don't know how how you are reacting so instead of waiting for asking any question at the end i would prefer if somebody has any question just stop me right there and i'll try to try to answer so today i'm going to talk about error estimation in theoretical nuclear models so this is my basic outline of my talk so i'll try to motivate why we are trying to talk about error estimation in theoretical nuclear models because usually when we talk about uh, errors we see some error bars in experimental measurements where always the measurements are accompanied by how much error was associated with the measurement but today we are going to talk about uh, theoretical models especially nuclear models where i will try to explain that why it is also necessary to 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 show everybody that there is also error associated with the theoretical calculations and after this brief introduction i'll try to demonstrate a very simple problem uh, with liquid drop model i think uh, this talk was meant for young students so i don't know how many young students are here right now but in any case i i'll go go forward with it so i hope here everybody has some idea about or at least heard of liquid drop model because i'll also explain what i what i mean by liquid drop model and then i try to explain uh, uh, some some example to show that the error estimation is important and how it can reveal actually good physics out of uh, very simplistic calculations so let me start with a comment made by famous statistician uh, from uh, united kingdom he made this comment is one of his books that remember that all models are wrong the practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful so in in practical sense uh, this is true that we uh, we we always uh, understand that we when we try to demonstrate a system with a theoretical model uh, if we do not know the exact physics behind uh, those governing system we associated uh, we associate a model with it but if 
it reproduces the, the physical observables good enough, then we are satisfied that our model is good. And this was very rightly pointed out by the editorial board of uh, Physical Review, the American uh, Physical Society, in 2011, and uh, when they were receiving more and more papers on uh, theoretical calculations, but without any error estimates. So I quote from uh, that editorial that it is all too often the case that the numerical results are presented without uncertainty estimates. Authors sometimes say that it is difficult to arrive at the error estimates. Should this be considered an adequate reason for omitting them? But why, why these errors uh, arrive in theoretical models? There are primarily three reasons. Because more often than not, in, in physical systems, we, we do not know the, the exact governing principles. So we start with some assumptions. And after obtaining our model, we try to extrapolate that model to predict uh, observables where we don't know what is going on. And more often than not, when we try to work with the experiments or design an experiment or to understand the, the observations of an experiment, we, we need theoretical models to predict so that we can, we can design our experimental methods also. So these are the basic three reasons. It's because of our lack of knowledge of the system, which, uh, which uh, brings us to, to error in our prediction. But why, why we are talking about this in uh, uh, nuclear models? So before going into that discussion, let me, let me try to explain why we need nuclear models. Because we know that uh, nucleus is made of a uh, few neutrons and protons which is a microscopic system. So the basic uh, dynamics of the system or the statics of the system uh, is, uh, is explained by quantum mechanics. And the best system we know, which is explained by quantum mechanics, by solving Schrodinger equation, the wave function of the, of the system, is the hydrogen atom problem, where it, a, a, an electron revolves around a proton and we, we calculate the kinetic energy and, and uh, the potential, which is uh, given by the Coulomb potential. And we, we solve the Schrodinger equation and we try to uh, analyze. But things are, are not so simple. Is the, is the metal where the electrons, a lot of them, revolve around of the ions. And we have Pugadro number of electrons uh, uh, system. So here we 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 um, the whole uh, two body interaction in between the electrons. So what we do there, as we have the fields there, we 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 kind of consider it as an electron gas. And uh, we, we try to demonstrate the, uh, moving around where we consider that all the electrons are in a, within a potential. And then we try to explain observables of the system. But it is an, it's very simplistic like an atom. Neither it is statistically uh, numerous enough by these uh, standard theories of, of statistical mechanics. So here we have Q tends to max, uh, one or two hundred uh, new neutrons and protons, and we try to understand the system, uh, their dynamics uh, with some theory. The, the numbers are cannot solve the many body the theory explicitly, and neither we did apply like, uh, this uh, electric in metals and statistics. This we also exact uh, form of the interaction between two nucleons. The life to understand the nucleus really. So uh, nucleus is uh, more than 100 years ago. 
The first speaker, Dr. Ben, as they explained how the the, the uh, science of was uh, and is there a question? Chiranjeev, is the internet problem is okay? I mean, I think there is an internet problem because your sound is cracking. Ah. Yes. Uh, this sometimes it is cutting. So can you please check? I I don't know because from from this slide downwards actually when you started this slide from that. This so from this slide onwards. Oh, yeah, yeah. From this slide onwards, sound is cracking. Here, now it is uh, audible? Uh, it is audible, but... It's not very clear, but uh, vaguely uh, audible. But <laughs> as there are uh, undergraduate students, then if the full sentence is not audible, then problem. Okay, then proceed, proceed. Um, proceed, proceed, proceed. Here, uh, what I talked about hydrogen, when... You proceed from the next slide. It will be okay, I think. Yeah, it's, you proceed from the uh, next slide. Uh -huh. No need to again go back to the okay. previous. Mm -hmm. Back. Uh, so, what I... Uh, the, the nucleonic system, a, a nucleus, is uh, as simple as hydrogen atom where you can solve the the sort or it is not significant enough to apply the mean field theory in in metals and on top of this that form of the interaction between two nucleons so this makes the life of uh, understanding nuclei over the years even after discovering nucleus of uh, alive and kicking. So we we need uh, different type of models to uh, the nucleus. And one of these uh, groundbreaking models was discovered almost proposed, not discovered, uh, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, the liquid. So in a liquid, the nucleus is thought. Uh, a drop of a liquid, try to uh, system or the energy of the system by the, energy, the surface energy and the Coulomb energy of the system in between the between the. But we also as uh, which is called the asymmetry energy, where was I? Yeah, I was talking about liquid drop model. So it was by, proposed by George Gamble developed by Bohr and Wheeler, the nuclear theory of fission, uh, pointed out by Dr. Banerjee in the first presentation today. Here I'm, I'm going to show you the, the, the plot is basically the binding energy for, for different nucleus, different stable nuclei, which are known. This was originally proposed by Baker, uh, which uh, model where they had uh, four different contributing to the energy. The volume term, the surface term, the, new, uh, the, the, the Coulomb term, which works between all the protons, and the asymmetry term, which arrives in the system because of, because of the asymmetry of neutrons and protons. So this very simplistic model actually ex explain the average property of the binding energy per nucleon for almost all the stable nuclei. But later on, it was found that there are some nuclei which are more stable than their neighbors. So this definitely uh, cannot be explained by, uh, by a collective property. So this has to have some, some local property between uh, working between few, few particles within the system which was explained by the shell model, which was uh, proposed by Meyer and Jensen in uh, early 1960s. 
this and they put all the particles within a within a potential and then try to stack the different particles in in nuclear shells and that's how they explain that why some uh, nuclei should be should be more stable than the others and they their predictions uh, were remarkably rightly found out later on in different experiments so this actually uh, inspired a, a very wide range of uh, nuclear mean field models and uh, some of them are non relativistic in nature that means the the kinetic energy of the system is uh, given by the without without taking care of the uh, relativistic formalism and the most popular ones which are uh, remarkably good at reproducing uh, different experimental data are the the skarm and the goni where the skarm works on uh, the interaction between two nucleons should be a uh, contact so two nucleons uh, interact with each other only when they contact each other however this uh, interactions they take care of uh, the the finite range of the nuclear force that means even when two nucleons do not contact with each other they can interact through some uh, through some interaction by given by this uh, goni force but of course uh, nucleons should be considered as uh, relativistic particles because they move within the system uh, in in uh, very high speed so one should actually incorporate uh, relativity within uh, within the dynamics of the system and which is done by uh, several different uh, family of relativistic models where instead of uh, uh, where instead of uh, uh, i mean the two particles interact through some uh, bosons and instead of uh, uh, explaining the system by solving a equation uh, one tries to understand the system by solving the dirac equation and for both these cases uh, there is an alternative which is the density functional theory which is alternative to this uh, mean field models in the sense that here you do not consider the particles uh, move in a mean field because of some interaction rather you try to express the energy of the system uh, through some densities and it was uh, shown by kohn and sham for electronic system that this is exactly equivalent of uh, putting the particles in a mean field so all these different type of models be it uh, mean field models or models based on density functional theory so they try to express the the energy of the system by 10 to 12 parameters now how to determine these 10 to 12 parameters you feed your theory to real experimental observables and try to minimize the the difference between your prediction and the the experimental value of of any observable so all these model even though uh, they are based on uh, some uh, microscopic principle they are not really from the first principle because as we know that nucleons that is the neutrons and protons are not the building blocks of the of the nuclei the most fundamental particles are quarks and gluons so starting from the interaction between quarks and gluons if one tries to to understand the the binding of a nucleus it is extremely extremely difficult and those are the models which try to do this are called ab initio models that is starting from the very first principle but with this kind of uh, models where one tries to to understand the system starting from uh, solving the 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 quantum chromodynamics uh, uh, energy density which has to be solved on uh, which is called uh, the, the the lattice quantum chromodynamics calculation because you have to put your quarks in a in a finite size lattice and then you solve the the qcd lagrangian and then you try to uh, uh try to find the the binding of the system so with this kind of first principle pro, uh, first principle models uh, so far with our limitation in the in the computational techniques uh, we have only reached maybe 12 carbon or maybe 16 oxygen so far 
using the best supercomputers uh, available to us. So people have relied uh, mostly on this uh, density functional theory or uh, mean field models, be it shell models or uh, SCAR models or GONI models or those kind of models. So when you you understand your your system by by this kind of so-called phenomenological models, so your your models are not uh, exactly based on first principles. So these they are not exactly accurate. So you need to you need to uh, fit your theory that is the parameters of the model, and then you try to uh, predict some uh, some uh, new observables. So of course. When you try to extrapolate or uh, predict new new observables, one needs to uh, specify what is the error associated with your prediction. So this is why when we use uh, this kind of phenomenological models, we we introduce error to the system. And the primary reason behind that that we do not know the same medium interaction and we we rely on this uh, phenomenological uh, analogy in the system. And as we know that we, we cannot solve the many-body equations within the, within the nucleonic system, this also uh, introduces more errors in the system. And as I have just uh, pointed out before, that we, we do not know exactly how to solve the, 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 the QCD Lagrangian and from where we can predict the properties of nuclei. So when we, we talk about errors, two different types of errors. One, which is the statistical errors. So, models which I have just explained before, where we try to feed a data set, and from there we want to feed our model parameters. We, of course, associated some errors uh, on our model parameters because we feed the data, which is also not exact, because there is also some uh, error associated with the but usually when uh, somebody makes uh, this kind of phenomenological models, they are actually quantifiable. And in modern days, uh, the, the most used technique is the so-called covariance analysis. And I'm sure everybody here is uh, uh, accustomed with the name uh, machine learning nowadays because all these uh, social media or internets are governed by this uh, machine learning and so-called artificial intelligence. And just to mention here, because I, I thought this would be interesting to point out, that the, the, the basic uh, governing uh, principle behind all those techniques is this statistical uh, covariance analysis. But today I am not going to uh, show much about these statistical errors, but usually uh, when uh, somebody does uh, very very modern day calculations or uh, predictions, they usually come with the statistical errors. So the models, when you do not know the the exact physics behind the system, just by studying the statistical errors, one can reveal actually a great deal about uh, different models. But today I'm going to actually concentrate on a different type of error which is called the systematic error. Now, why these kind of errors appear in the system? Because, as I have just mentioned before, that our parameterizations are not perfect. And sometimes we, we start with wrong assumptions. And because we do not know the exact physics of the system, so that actually introduces from the very beginning, just by constructing our model, some errors in the system. So. These are not because of fitting some data or uh, how many parameters you have in your model. This is basically because of lack of our knowledge. And as we do not know the exact uh, model, especially in the case of uh, nuclear physics, uh, we have to be very careful uh, when we want to predict something or when we want to uh, demonstrate a system by some theory. But the problem is that in, in, in really difficult systems, there is no perfect strategy to find systematic errors. So in other words, one can say that there is no systematic way to study systematic errors. So this is why I, I have chosen today to actually demonstrate with a very simplistic example 
where I will start with the, the liquid drop model uh, for the binding energy of some uh, even even nucleus with uh, proton number Z and nuclear number A given by this expression where this is the volume term which is the only binding term and the rest of the three terms the surface term the the coulomb term and the asymmetry term they are the repulsive terms so the volume term tries to bind the system and this three uh, term tries to uh, disrupt the system so usually in uh, in a in an ideal case what would be my my proposition i would try to minimize an objective function which is usually given by uh, I square function as a function of a parameter set, which is in our case the, the four parameters, the volume parameter, the surface parameter, the Coulomb parameter, and the symmetry energy parameter. And we start with some given experimental data of binding energy, which is already known to us uh, from uh, several experiments over last century. And then uh, with a given set of values for these four number, four parameters, we, we have this so-called theoretically predicted value for the binding energy and in the denominator we have the the error associated with uh, with any experimental observables uh, while uh, doing the experiment so in an ideal case what i would do i'll take uh, some some set of experimental binding energy and i'll try to vary these four parameters and i'll try to minimize this value of chi square and then i'll say that these are the set of four values of these four parameters, uh, which predicts really well all these different set of uh, uh, set of binding energy data I have taken. And then I can try to use those four parameters to predict even which uh, for those nuclei for which the binding energy is not measured. But that would be the, the proposition to understand the, the statistical errors. But today we are going to do it in a, in a different way because we are trying to understand the systematic errors, how systematic errors get introduced in the system. So we start with some very good values of these four parameters, uh, because I hope uh, most of here are, uh, are uh, accustomed with liquid model. These are very standard numbers uh, for these four parameters. And what I have done, I have used these four parameters and I have taken a set of values for Z and A, and I have generated the value of the binding energy by using this formula here. So in principle, I have generated my own experimental uh, data set, which I, which I can call pseudo data. So by this, I am ensuring that I know the exact theory of the system because I have generated my own data. Now what I will do, I will start with some uh, random values of these four parameters and I'll try to minimize the chi-square to see whether I can arrive at this uh, at these uh, four values what I have uh, shown here. And with this, I'll try to see uh, what is the evolution of residual error happening for all assets. For the residual error is just the difference between the, bind, uh, the binding energy in our case, the observable, which I'm predicting, and the one which I have generated by using these four numbers here. So in principle, as I, as I know that my, my exact theory uh, beforehand, when I, when I do this practice, I see that the, the residual error distribution for all different uh, nuclei I have uh, used in my calculation is essentially zero. So I arrive at the model which I have started with. So this ensures me that my, my calculation of this uh, chi-square value is working well. Now I play with the, the volume term. Instead of using the volume term as A volume times A, I change the dependence on the number of particles to 0.999. And you can see that there is a, a difference building between the, the predicted value, which I have arrived at, uh, from the starting value which I have generated using those four uh, given parameters. And this becomes even more prominent which I, when, I, when I change the volume down even further. It's that there is some kind of pattern 
uh, arriving in the in the residual layer uh, when I when I change my volume term. One can also see what is happening when I when I uh, change my surface term because if you recall here that my surface term is proportional to the number of particles as uh, 0.6 recurring. So when I change this to just 0.6, you can see there is a pattern of uh, uh, a pattern of error appearing in the residual error uh, between the, my predicted value and my uh, and my uh, so-called pseudo data. And similar thing one can also observe for uh, the symmetry term. So basically, when one sees a pattern of errors, which is uh, not understandable by some standard laws of uh, statistics, so one has to be very careful to be sure of those kind of models because you you know that there might be some uh, systematics you have uh, incorporated in the system without knowing the the, the, the underlying uh, physics of the system. So let us uh, let us go now in a bit more uh, realistic situation where instead of uh, using those uh, exact model given by this uh, generated by these four parameters i take uh, real experimental uh, binding energies and if i use my my very simplistic uh, liquid drop model to feed the to feed the the binding energies you can see that here also there is some kind of systematics and if you recall when i uh, told you before that there are some nuclei which are more stable uh, than their neighbors and which was explained by the by the shell models by the shell model and this number of particles are uh, usually called as a magic number and as we know that later on this uh, liquid drop model was uh, further modified to incorporate this uh, quantum mechanical uh, quantum mechanical corrections so as our model do not have those kind of corrections. You can see that the the model actually uh, deviates more uh, to predict the the binding energy from the experiment properly at values of neutron numbers, say 28, 50, 82, or 126, which are the the known magic numbers uh, existing in nuclear. So I stop here. Uh, with a concluding remark, which is uh, actually very wittingly summarized by uh, an American uh, author and philosopher, that I have come loaded with statistics, for I have noticed that a man cannot prove anything without statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Chiranjit. Now the session is open for uh, discussion. If anyone has any query, please feel free to ask him. Hello, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can uh, hear you. So, so yes. I have one basic question. Uh, yes, when you talked about different models that we use to describe the nucleus, uh, yes. you mentioned uh, relativistic models and uh, density functional models. So my yes. ask, the question is, if uh, the nucleons are not moving relativistically inside nucleons, which yes. is, I think, uh, most of the times is the case, then uh, why do we need to use relativistic models? Uh, the, the thing is that, as I, as I mentioned uh, during my talk, that all these models are phenomenological models. They are not exact, uh, they are not based on uh, exact uh, interaction between two nucleons. So, for example, in, in non-relativistic models, which you are actually saying is right, but if you if you recall that you can describe the, the binding energy of, uh, not binding energy, the kinetic energy of any system, if you are governed by the, the relativity, or if you are not governed by the relativity, you can actually arrive from one formula to another, right? Because when you when you incorporate the relativity, instead of uh, solving the Schrodinger equation, you solve the Dirac equation. But if you if you impose your your non-relativistic limit, you can actually arrive uh, from uh, relativistic calculation to non-relativistic calculation. 
So in that way, there is no direct conflict between uh, incorporating relativity in the system. Do you agree with me? Uh, yes, I kind of agree, but uh, uh, what specific thing uh, that we means what do what extra do we get out from the relativistic? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, that's a very good question because uh, in in non-relativistic models, uh, especially the the spin orbit coupling, uh, which uh, which actually determines the, the last occupied levels layer near the Fermi surface, are almost put by hand. So you you see in some experiments how these uh, occupied levels are behaving, and accordingly you fix your spin orbit term uh, almost by hand. But in relativistic models, uh, this spin orbit is automatic. So the yes. moment you 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 write your Lagrangian of the system, the spin orbit is actually come uh, spin orbit comes into the into the description of the system very naturally. So here you do not need to play with those uh, single particle nature uh, to to explain directly. Okay, thank you. Any more question? If no question are there, let us thank the speaker. Thank you, Chiranjeev, for the wonderful okay. speech. So I have request that uh, please provide your mail ID in the chat box for the future purpose okay. for the participants. Okay. Well, thank you. Now I request uh, Dr. Swati Modi. Swati is here. Swati. Swati. Ha, hello, Mona. Ha, are you here? Ha, oh, yes. So now, uh, Dr. Swati Modi will deliver her talk. Before that, I would like to give brief introduction about uh, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati has done his BSc and MSc from Rajasthan University. Later, she joined uh, doctoral degree at IIT Roorkee. And now he, uh, she is the assistant professor at Birsa Institute of Technology, Jharkhand. So uh, before with this much of introduction, I would like to invite Swati to deliver her lecture. Swati, please. Uh, can you see my slides? Are you able to see my slides? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, can see. Yes, 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 yes. Presenting to a uh i cannot see my slide am i audible you are audible but i, I cannot audible. see your slide slides it is so it is beyond the screen i think okay uh, uh, you have to go be, you have to go to the uh, yes uh, now, now, now it is see. visible now it is okay. visible okay 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 thank you no make it full screen yeah maybe okay is it okay? No, okay, okay. Okay, it's good. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Monalisa, uh, Ryan sir, Chiru, and Tathagat, and the other professors and students. I am uh, Swati Modi, an assistant professor in Department of Physics, BIT Sindri. Am I audible? Yes, Perfect. yes, you are very Perfect. clearly audible. Yes. Perfectly okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, the topic, today's my topic is fission theory and application. Okay. So, the outline of my talk, uh, since this presentation is only uh, for graduation students, so I made it very, very simple. Uh, the outline of my talk is like this. I will present only the thing which are already discovered. I will not present my research. So, so it's very simple talk. Um, concentrated on BSc students only. Okay. So outline of my talk is first I will explain the history and concept of uh, nuclear fission. 
then some characteristic of fission like chain reaction and um, and the binding energy curve which uh, which is obtained by using liquid drop model uh, chiranjeev model has already explained the uh, full formula of liquid drop model uh, so from initially from the liquid drop model only uh, the fission was explained means uh, uh, why fission phenomena happen so the reason behind the fission is initially explained by using uh, <laughs> binding energy curve obtained from the liquid drop model then we will see the uh, asymmetric and symmetric fission this is also the characteristic of fission so like this we will explain i will explain some uh, some uh, phenomena some characteristic of fission then i uh, will go to, to application of chain reaction uh, our main motive is to to apply the fission phenomena uh, to apply the fission phenomena so that we can use the energy extract from the fission in our daily life huh? uh, so i will explain the application and then then few few things about fusion too so i'll explain the difference between fission and fusion and then nuclear power plants in india based on uh, nuclear fission okay then uh, since i am theoretician i work on theoretical nuclear physics so i will uh, show some models only i will explain uh, some model by using theory uh, i will not show the full uh, mathematical description etc so some models uh, people use some models to explain a uh, nuclear fission so let's start the history of nuclear fission so first it was investigated is what it was found out it was found out by horn otto horn and strossman in 1938 um so uh, for this discovery of nuclear fission otto horn also got a nobel prize of physics a nobel prize of chemistry chemistry okay so it it was uh, now we think that uh, nuclear physics nuclear uh, fission fission is uh, part of uh, physics but he got nobel prize uh, for finding out fission but the area was chemistry okay um so he did bomb uh, he did a uh, bombardment of neutrons over uranium 235 sample and then expected that uranium 235 will absorb neutrons and become some heavy nucleus hmm? but instead of that the product showed different chemical properties that cannot be explained by otto horn and his student stress stressman so uh, the different property was obviously the fission means it 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 was not the heavier nucleus but it it uh, uh, converted into uh, two or three or more nuclei which were fission fragments so these theory which cannot be explained by horn and strossman was explained by meitner and frisch lise meitner and otto frisch so these are two scientists who explained the nuclear fission theoretically so they explained the result of horn and strossman in 1939 so they explained that instead of heavier uranium it had split into smaller elements which is this phenomena is known as nuclear fission so they they were explained they were give, uh, they were the uh, the person who who um, who uh, give the name of nuclear fission uh, which was uh, find out initially by horn and strossman so this is the history how nuclear fission was uh, discovered okay and now we'll see what is nuclear fission so splitting of heavier nuclei into lighter nuclei is known as nuclear fission so for example if we have uranium 235 and it is bombarded by neutrons this is the neutron 
and if it is if uranium 235 is bombarded by neutron then it absorb neutron this is the thermal neutron okay uh, for thermal neutron the fission cross section is high and if uh, the high energy neutron is used then the fission cross section will be low we will talk about later we will talk about this later on okay so uranium 235 absorb a uh, thermal neutron and goes into uranium 236 in excited state you see these spikes uh, in outer uh, surface at uh, uranium 236 these these spikes show the excitation of uranium 236 so uh, uranium 236 which has half life of uh, 703 million years sorry uranium 235 has this much half life so uranium 235 has very small half life and it it eventually converts into krypton 92 and barium 141 uh, these are only for presentation purpose uh, there may be some other uh, fission fragments other than krypton 92 and barium 141 so these two are most probable krypton 92 and barium are most probable fission fragments but there is finite probability of uh, of uh, some other fission fragments too so and these three are again three neutrons these three are three neutrons which also emit by this reaction nuclear fission reaction and the energy we get energy too by this fission fission reaction so for uranium 235 for the case of uranium 235 this energy is uh, nearly 200 mev okay now oh, one can calculate this energy very easily this is related to the mass defect you can see how much energy will we get will be uh, obtained from this uh, reaction is given by e equal to mc square the einstein's formula e equal to mc square this explains the mass defect means the the mass defect means uh, the decrease in mass okay so uranium uh, mass defect uh, i think bsc students know the definition of mass defect uh, a nucleus has so many nucleons nucleons means neutrons and protons so if we add the masses of individual nucleons means masses of all the protons plus all the neutrons uh and then if we make uranium 235 uranium 235 has 92 uh protons and 235 minus 92 neutrons so if we make uranium 235 with 92 protons and 235 minus 92 neutrons then the total mass of uranium 235 will be lesser than the masses of individual neutrons so this difference in mass is known as mass defect okay so when uranium 236 236 ha goes through fission fission and becomes krypton 92 and barium 141 then there is again mass mass uh, difference so this mass difference goes into energy this mass is equal to energy through this formula e equal to mc square so this this energy is the one which we get from nuclear fission uh when uranium 236 converts into krypton and barium so the total mass of nucleus is less than the sum of masses of individual nuclei this is the definition of mass defect so this uh, slide explains how we achieve energy how we obtain energy by use in this nuclear fission reaction okay and this is the binding energy curve which i was talking earlier uh this binding energy curve through this binding energy curve we will uh, we can easily know about the reason behind the nuclear fission so here this uh, binding energy curve is obtained through liquid drop model which was earlier explained by uh, uh, by the speakers and uh, here at the x axis you will see the mass number a a a is the total mass of uh, nucleus like uranium 235 has mass number 235 uh, 
okay and this y axis is negative of binding energy per nucleon in mev binding energy per nucleon okay so here you can see the spikes at uh, some uh, points like uh, hydrogen 2 lithium 6 lithium 6 is at the bottom and this is helium 4 is at this at this point carbon 12 oxygen 16 so these nuclei which are at the spikes at the peak has more binding energy than the nuclei at the neighboring points so in this way you can see the highest binding energy it, uh, the nucleus with highest binding energy is iron 56 and as we go towards higher a towards higher mass numbers the binding energy per nucleon decreases so here you can see at uranium 235 the binding energy is small compared to this krypton and barium is also here 92 barium ah uh, sorry barium 92 yeah so you can see the krypton and barium has higher binding energy than uranium 235 so when uranium 235 undergoes nuclear fission it converts into the nuclei with a higher binding energy means higher stability means higher abundance so uh, so this is the reason why nucleus undergoes fission because it wants to achieve stability it is unstable its binding energy is smaller so after fission it uh, will convert it will convert into nuclei with with higher binding energy so this is the main reason and so also th this is the reason we get uh, energy in nuclear fission okay we study nuclear fission because this is a source of energy and uh, in this world uh, our main problem is is energy we want to uh, obtain more and more energy we as rainser uh, already explained we have so many sources of energy and uh, like coal water wind from wind water we can obtain energy so this uh, fission phenomena is also a source of energy this this is called as nuclear energy so uh, we uh, study nuclear fission because we want to gain energy we want to use the energy uh, extra extract we want to extract energy through nuclear fission okay so uh, this is the another uh, phenomena or another characteristic of nuclear fission this is about the fission fragments means if one nucleus undergoes nuclear fission then it uh, it uh, emits uh, sorry nucleus as a whole converts into two or three or more nuclei okay so these daughter nuclei are known as a nuclear uh, fission fragments okay so this is the yield percent fission yield so at y axis there is percent percent fission yield and at x axis you will see mass number so here uh, uranium 235 fission uh, this curve is for uranium 235 fission so you can see that uh, we have this uh, inverted w shape for the percent fission yield uh, so this shows the asymmetric fission means uranium 235 uh fission of uranium 235 gives two different nuclei with two different mass numbers like i have already told you we will have barium 141 and krypton 92 as the most probable fission fragments so this this peak we have two peaks ha huh? in, in this inverted w we have two peaks this peak corresponds to 92 okay 92 means krypton 92 and this peak corresponds to 140 or 141 so this is barium 141 so these two are the most probable fission yield most probable fission uh, fragments so the yield of these two 
nuclei is largest than the other so there there is also probability there uh, probability of finding other nuclei like you you will see in this curve the dots are the exact uh, nuclei which we will have through the fission of uranium 235 uh so there is a finite probability of uh, so many fission fragments so many nuclei but you will see the other thing also the second characteristic is that if we have uh, bombarded neutrons with thermal energy those are known as thermal neutrons then we will have uh, a very explicit inverted w type of uh, fission yield but as we increase the energy of neutrons like 14 mev then this w shape becomes as a single humped means here you will see this double hump i mean this uh, double peak but as we increase energy of the bomb- bombarding neutrons this will uh, this will go towards the single peak so that will correspond to symmetric fission means the uh, fission yield of a single nucleus will be large will be largest okay so that corresponds to uh, symmetric fission so if we have two different fission fragments that is for that uh, that shows asymmetric fission and if we have one uh, most probable nucleus as fission fragment then that corresponds to symmetric fission so what is the reason behind this asymmetric and symmetric fission uh, this is related to the shell cro- shell uh, sh- shell effect or shell structure of the nucleus shell structure of the nucleus uh, gives the magic number which corresponds to the stability of the nuclei so uh, the nuclei which which are near to the magic number means protons and neutrons are near to the magic number you 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 know the magic number 2 8 20 28 50 82 126 126 these are few numbers where uh, there is shell closure means nucleus has uh, a closed shell structure now they are very much stable because their shell shell are closed shells are closed so uh, it is very tough to break those nuclei because they are shell closed nucleus and most stable so we will have the fission fragments uh fission fragments uh corresponds to those nuclei which are near to the shell closure or which are most stable okay so this asymmetric and symmetric fission is related to those things hmm? shell closure magic numbers etc but uh, but uh, people are uh, investigating thoroughly on this uh, problem this problem is not fully solved yet okay so there are uh, so many theories behind this m type of structure the asymmetric fission and the symmetric fission so people are still investigating on this problem uh, now uh, this is the another type of characteristic of nuclear fission that is chain reaction so nuclear fission releases more neutrons which triggers more fission so if we have incident neutron and this is fissionable nucleus by absorbing this neutron this uh, nucleus will be in dumbbell shape will have some repulsion some attraction the competition between attraction and repulsion if repulsion is large then there will be a dumbbell shape and uh, after that there is a fission point where nucleus undergoes fission so in the fission we will have energy this is the energy and also we will have neutrons which emit with along with the fission fragments so these neutrons will again are uh, ready to take participate in in further fission 
so we will have another fission fissionable nucleus uh, the this nucleus is also available the initial nucleus is also available means there is finite uh, there is a half life few of the nuclei will undergo fission few will remain so these neutrons which uh, emit through the fission will be available for the for the next fission so in this way we will have chain reaction so this will go on until all the nuclei the fissionable nuclei uh, will finish so this will never stop this is the chain reaction will go on uh, so so for using the fission energy we we will have control over this chain reaction so uh, we have already nuclear reactors and uh, and uh, there are seven nuclear power plants in our country so we have control over this chain reaction so that we can use this energy for peaceful purpose uh, so uh, this is the application of controlled chain reaction so how we control this chain reaction by using cathode roots those are called those are known as control roots so application of controlled chain reaction the first is atomic bomb bomb this is the des destructing application means this can uh, destruct the whole world the atomic bomb and you already know uh, at, in japan hiroshima nagasaki uh, this atomic bomb is already used and so it is very much very much harmful and so but this is the application of a controlled chain reaction the atomic bomb trigger a chain reaction in uranium 235 for plutonium 239 so for this atomic bomb uh, uh, i think you already know the uh, the uh, concept behind atomic bomb that there should be a critical mass and if mass of the uh, fish fissionable nucleus is lesser than this critical mass then the the chain reaction will not uh, occur there will not be a chain reaction so must have minimum amount of radioactive element to sustain the chain reaction that is called as critical mass okay so there there is a uh, three or four um four pieces of uh, 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 fissionable nucleus like uh, uranium 235 and uh, each each piece has mass lesser than the critical mass and there is some separator between these two three pieces and if one removes the separator then those mass will join and that then the whole mass will be larger than the critical mass and the chain reaction starts because there is also a, uh, a small chamber of uh, neutrons thermal uh -huh. neutrons and if as soon uh, those masses are joined the neutrons will also emit from the chamber and the chain reaction will start so this is the atomic bomb uh, application of controlled chain reaction so and the second peaceful application is nuclear power plant convert heat energy this is heat h e a t okay uh, sorry uh, so uh, converts heat energy from fission reaction into electricity so this is the peaceful uh, use of nuclear fission so heat energy heat energy that produces through the fission will be used uh, to 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 heat up the energy released in a uh, fission will be used to heat up the water and uh, then uh, through through the water vapor the dynamo will work and thus we will produce the ele electricity so uh, in nuclear power plant electricity will be produced in america as rain sir also, also showed a slide in which he he has shown the uh, uses of nuclear energy by different uh, countries hmm? 
Hmm? So America uh, uses 6% of its total energy uh, by nuclear fission. Hmm? So uh, nuclear fission is a very good source of electricity energy. In our country, in India, uh, nearly 3% of the total energy is, the, is from the nuclear energy. So controlled chain reaction is used in nuclear power plant two, where we use controlled roads, uh, which absorbs neutrons emitted in chain reaction. You already know that neutrons will be emit uh, in the chain reaction that will be used for the um, for the further reaction. So it, it will it will the main switch to 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 the chain reaction. Okay. And also some artificial satellites were also used. Artificial satellites were also used the fuels with the nuclear energy. Okay, uranium-235 was used as a fuel in some artificial satellite like SNAP-10A and Rostats, etc. Uh, this is the schematic of a nuclear reactor. So I think BSC students have all, uh, already seen this picture. Uh, this is the nuclear reactor cathode control roads. This is control road and here we'll have the fissionable nucleus and this is the exchanger steam generator. Hmm? Steam generator means nuclear energy will uh, will be here and it will convert water into steam and this this is water pump condenser and turbine it this energy will use in turbine and this is electric generator and then we'll have supply electric supply so this is the nuclear reactor uh, this is only for your knowledge uh, i mean if someone is very much interested in nuclear physics then uh, he or she will Mm, go through these things. Now we'll uh, see the fission versus fusion, the difference between these two. So in fission, uh, we'll have fissionable nucleus, neutron uh, will be absor absorbed by this nucleus and then we'll have fission uh, fragments, these two. We have already seen this picture, okay? and. In fusion, we'll have two, two nuclei, which will fuse and become a single nucleus. So in this process too, we'll have energy. And you already know, I think you know that fusion uh, energy is much larger than the fission energy uh, with, the, with the same amount of nuclei. If we have one kilogram of uranium-235 and one kilogram of hydrogen, then uh, with by fusion of hydrogen, we'll have helium. Huh? Like this reaction happens in sun. Huh? This fusion reaction happens in sun. So one kilogram of uh, hydrogen will give more energy uh, through fusion reaction compared to the one kilogram of uranium-235 in the fission reaction. Okay, so sun in sun or other stars, uh, there will there is fusion reaction. The hydrogen will convert into helium. So there is fusion reaction. So uh, for fusion reaction, uh, the initial conditions are uh, are different. Are different means uh, the large, very large temperature, uh, the pressure, uh, etc., are required for fusion reaction for starting the fusion reaction. So, if there is a fission, will have very much energy. Then the fission can be trigger the fusion reaction. Okay. Uh, the initial conditions of fusion can be fulfilled by the fission reaction. Okay, so in laboratory, people are also trying for fusion react fusion reaction, and I think uh, already hydrogen bomb are made by South Korea. 
South Korea? North Korea? No, South Korea. Uh, yes, uh, in paper we have read about this, uh, that they have made the fusion bomb, the hydrogen bomb. But I don't know the reality. So this bomb will be very much harmful. This, maybe this can, mm, this can end the world. But yeah, maybe this is rumor. I, I don't know. Okay, so... So this is the fission fusion difference a difference between this fission and fusion. So why the nuclear fission more dangerous than nuclear fusion? Nuclear fission is a chain reaction. Only under controlled condition we can harvest the energy of fission. Controlled condition means uh, in atomic bomb we'll have critical mass. And in nuclear power plant, in nuclear reactor, we will have control roads. So whereas nuclear fusion is not a chain reaction. Once we disrupt it, the process comes to a halt. This is not the chain reaction, nuclear fusion. So this is the difference between these two. Nuclear fission produces way more radioactive substance than nuclear fusion, a uh, nuclear fission. So the fission fragments are also radioactive elements. So this is the demerit of nuclear fission. Hmm. How, how will uh, we will get rid of those uh, radioactive fission fragments? Those are also harmful, very harmful for uh, for living elements, living bodies. So in nuclear fission, we'll have radioactive substance than nuclear fusion. In nuclear fission, heavy nucleus divides into two unstable fragments, and these unstable fragments undergo many radioactive decays to become stable. Okay, you already know about the stability and instability by using the binding energy curve, uh, binding energy per nucleon and uh, mass number curve, which I have already uh, presented in my earlier slides. So, so uh, in nuclear fission, heavy nucleus divides into two unstable fragments and this Unstable fragments undergo many radioactive decays to become stable, whereas in nuclear fusion, small nuclei combine to form a heavy nucleus, and this involves very less emission of radioactive substances. Okay, so this is clear. Now, this is about the nuclear power plants in India. Hmm? So we have total 22 nuclear reactors in seven nuclear power plants. So these seven nuclear power plants are presented in this uh, map. Uh, this is the total installed energy, total installed capacity. So nearly 3% uh, energy is supplied by the nuclear uh, reactions, nuclear fission. So the seven nuclear power plants are at uh, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu. There is two power plant in Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat. Okay, and India's first nuclear reactor. First nuclear reactor. We have total twenty-two nuclear reactor. The first nuclear reactor was Apsara, and uh, installed at uh, Trombe, Mumbai on 20th January 1957. Hmm? This was installed only for research purpose. Hmm? The, after Apsara, we'll have Cyrus hmm, and Jarlina. They were also installed in Mumbai. So these three were for research purpose only. After that, uh, we'll have more nuclear reactors and um, they were for the daily life use, I mean, for electricity purpose. And uh, yes, this is the, this is the research related slide, means people are, people are doing research on nuclear fission. So we'll have many models for uh, study of fission. Uh, the well-known and the very initial model was a liquid drop model. In liquid, liquid drop model, uh, I think B, in BSc course, we, we study liquid drop model and how fission happens. So liquid drop model uh, thoroughly explain the fission hmm, for the undergrad students. 
So competition between the cohesive nuclear force, cohesive nuclear force means this is attractive and the disruptive Coulomb repulsion between protons. So when disruptive Coulomb repulsion is higher than the attractive nuclear force, then there is fission. After the liquid drop model, since there is many, uh, many drawback of liquid drop model, I mean, liquid drop model was not able to explain uh, the, the whole phenomena of uh, nuclear fission. So, so after liquid drop model, many, many more microscopic or more refined models uh, came. Uh, so thus the second was spherical shell model. Yeah. In liquid drop model, the nucleus was treated as a collective, uh, collective thing. Uh, means this is a, a nucleus which behaves like a uh, liquid drop. But in spherical shell model, the shell effect, the shell, uh, shell picture uh, was uh, considered. So then the spherical shell model came based on shell structure. Okay. So then the magic number also came. Uh, there is shell, then there is also shell closer, like in atomic, uh, atomic uh, physics, we study the shell closer. Mm. Uh, the inert gases have closed shell structure, so they are most stable. Like uh, atomic nucleus, we have the shell structure in um, in nuclear physics also. Like in atomic physics, we have the same structure in nuclear physics. So, so based on this shell structure, we will ha we had a model, spherical shell model, and this is the spherical shell model. I mean, a nucleus was treated as a sphere, but uh, in reality, nucleus can have any shape. Not only the spherical shape, it it uh, have deformation. It may have deformation. So Nielsen model came into picture, which considered the deformation also. And then unified model came, which uh, which includes shell model and collective motion, means rotation, vibration in the nucleus also. Then in Strutinsky model came shell effect as a correction to the potential energy of the liquid drop model. And like this, many more models came. And people are still uh, researching on, uh, people are still doing research on uh, nuclear fission. Uh, we are also started our, we have also started our research based on nuclear fission. We are using uh, density functional theory to, to find the binding energy and then we'll explain the, the microscopic fission uh, mechanism. So this is uh, the, potential, the potential well, potential energy versus deformation curve. So this is on, if people do research on, uh, on fission, then they, use this thing. So here if you see the potential energy curve has two type of shape. One single hump, this is the single hump presented by a dashed line. And this is with the continuous line, the double hump potential energy barrier is presented. So here, uh, in this double hump, this, uh, this potential well corresponds to deformation beta 1. And the second potential well corresponds to deformation beta 2. If there is fission through the first potential well, then this is the spontaneous fission, corresponds to spontaneous fission. And if nucleus is here, then this means nuclear will be in isomeric state. So this is isomer fission. So here at the top, you will see uh, initially this is a spher spherical shape and then deformed, then further deformation converts the nucleus into dumbbell shape. And after that, we'll have fission fragments.
so i stop my talk here and uh, if you want to ask questions please thank you swati now the session is open for questions hello swati this is chiranjeev ah uh -huh. yes hello chiranjeev yeah. i just have a comment i think uh, russia already has developed hydrogen bomb and they have even tested it ah uh, sorry 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 russia already has hydrogen bomb uh, okay they have also tested it uh, with uh, global news on their on their explosion ah so this is the only comment i want to on one okay okay thank you uh, anyone else anyone have any queries well if not then let us thank the speaker thank you swati for this uh, nice talk and um, thank you all for the uh, nice lovely uh, info very much informative uh, information given during this webinar now we have three uh, phd students they will uh, deliver their talk and uh, their talks will be basically for 15 minutes and 5 minutes discussion along with that i would like to announce the feedback form link is given in the chat box all of you are requested to fill the feedback form with valid email id now i request our student participant as virender ranga ranga are you here ha uh, yes sir so you can proceed with the start before that i will make a brief introduction ranga is a phd student at uh, iit roorkee and his area of interest is experimental nuclear physics as well as, well as some theoretical calculations so ranga you have 15 minutes uh, time uh, to deliver your talk along with five minutes discussion please okay so can you see my screen yeah yeah it is it is visible okay so first of all i would like to thank uh, dr monanisha dibar for giving me this opportunity to share some part of my research also i would uh, like to thank other members of organizing committee of, for this webinar okay so title of this webinar uh, is mystery of nucleus so i decided i will talk about how we unravel uh, the mystery of the nucleus so in this talk i will talk about how we can use nucleon nuclear scattering to probe the nucleus so probing the nucleus means to, uh, we want to have some useful information about the nucleus so for example what is the depth of potential in a nucleus what is the radius of the nucleus and uh, or uh, what is the diffuseness of the surface of the nucleus so uh, things like that so contents of my talk will be like this i will first start by introduction to scattering of light so this may seem very unrelated to nuclear physics but as we say as we see we will see that this uh, 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 scattering of light is actually very relatable and useful in describing scattering of nucleons scattering of nucleons talk of a more general that is used uh, to describe such scattering and then we how we can use the model to probe the nucleus and get some information at last i will summarize my talk okay so so scattering of light so with this uh, picture you can see there is a ball and light is coming from the left hand side and as it as it crosses the ball it uh, scatters from the ball so the pattern that we get here on this side which we all know as a diffraction pattern so this is uh, for illustration purposes only so we see that we get uh, circles of maximum and minimum intensity which we get uh, because of interference of light and if we 
draw intensity distribution of that light, we get something like this. So we have maxima, then minima, then maxima and minima, separated by some specific distances. So, uh, do we get any similar intensity distribution when the nucleon is scattered from the nucleus? So if we get such intensity distribution, then we can somehow use this uh, scattering of light or theory that is used to describe scattering of light and apply it to scattering of nucleons from the nucleus. So as it turns out, indeed we get some uh, this kind of uh, behavior from the nucleus. So for example, in uh, this plot, we have 16.9 MeV neutrons, which are scattered from calcium-40. So this the experimental data I have taken from Honor et al. Uh, published in PRC in uh, 1986. So on x-axis, we have angles, uh, uh, which is from the direction of beam to the uh, direction of scattered uh, neutron. And on y-axis, we have the cross-section. So we see this type of behavior which is similar to scattering of light from the uh, ball. So uh, what kind of theory do we have to describe this uh, kind of scattering? So this uh, solid line that you are seeing, which uh, beautifully describes this as, uh, angular distribution is actually calculated using uh, reaction code, reaction code called TALIS. So, uh, in this TALIS, 16.9 uh, MV neutrons were bombarded on calcium-40 and we calculated this angular distribution. So we see uh, that we have actually theory to describe such type of scattering and uh, further in the slides we will see how it is uh, related to scattering of light. So uh, before that we can draw other uh, similarities between scattering of light and this a scattering of nucleon. So what if we change the energy of incident neutron? So in this plot, we have the 16.9 MeV neutrons and 30 MeV neutrons, uh, which uh, I calculated using TALIS. So we see this is the 16.9 MeV neutrons. And this light blue one is for 30 MeV neutrons. So as the energy of incident nucleon is increased, the first minima is like shifted towards the central uh, maximum. Uh, this same way is observed in scattering light. So if we, uh, uh, in this case, the energy of incident neutron is increased. So the wavelength will of the matter wave associated with this neutron will be decreased. And so similarly, if we uh, decrease the wavelength of that is being scattered from a ball, then this maxima will also shift toward the central peak in case of scattering of light. We can also see this uh, if we, for example, uh, decrease the energy of neutrons. So for this is for 1 MeV neutrons, uh, which is compared with the previous 16.9 and 30 MeV neutrons. So if we uh, decrease the energy of neutrons, uh, Wavelength of matter waves will increase, and the corresponding first minima, which is now shifted here, so it, it has shifted from the central peak to outwards. So this similar behavior is also observed in scattering of light. Okay. So uh, we can also compare scattering of protons and neutrons. So uh, these both. 30 MeV protons and neutrons, both calculated using TALIS. So we see uh, more or less uh, similar kind of behavior at higher angles, but uh, uh, the cross section for neutrons, this is 30 MeV neutrons, kind of finite at uh, zero degree, but it uh, blows up at for protons at uh, zero degree. We can also see if we decrease the energy of uh, protons and neutrons, so in this case, it was 30 MeV neutrons and protons. Uh, in this case, it is 15 MeV. So energy is wavelength. So first, which is in case of neutrons at 40 degree. 
previously it was and for 40 around thing and it further increases the energy when it's a one mv so this when it shifts outward from the center b okay uh, now let us discuss some theory about this. so the theory that is used uh, to um, describe such scatterings is known as optical modal potential so this optical word has actually been taken from uh, the theory of theory in optics which is used to describe the scattering of light so in that theory in optics we use a complex refractive index to describe uh, scattering and absorption of light by a, a translucent crystal ball so that crystal ball will scatter light as well as absorb light similarly in this uh, optical model we use potential which is actually a complex so look at this term we have this uh, volume central term which is complex so th there is a real part and there is an imaginary part so this uh, real part will actually cause the scattering and this imaginary part is responsible for absorption of the incident nucleons so uh, in addition to this volume term we also have uh, surface terms so this uh, surface term includes a derivative of if a function f which is here which is actually wood section potential so if we take a derivative of wood section potential it will give, a, give some kind of gaussian so this surface term we actually approximate with some uh, some kind of gaussian potential we also have uh, spin orbit interaction terms and the coulomb term because obviously nuclear uh, nucleus uh, has also some coulomb charge so uh, expression for this coulomb uh, term is uh, given by this which is actually uh, expression for potential by a 3d sphere with the radius rc so for uh, for distances smaller than the radius of the this in this case the nucleus we have this expression and for radi uh, distances greater than the radius of this nucleus we have we will have this expression okay so now we will see how this can be used to uh, get some useful information about the nucleus So these are the uh, angular distribution plots for 15 MeV neutrons scattered from calcium 40, calculated using TALUS. These different curves describe uh, are calculated using different values of uh, we note the volume uh, potential center volume term. So this V V, so this V naught, uh, we have varied to see how the distributions change when we uh, vary the depth of the nu uh, nuclear potential. So, for example, at uh, this 48.50, V0 is 48.50, which is uh, the, the depth which dis actually describes the scattering of 15 MeV neutrons on calcium 40 is given by the solid line. And you see if we increase the depth to 50 MeV, so from 48 MeV to 50 MeV, blue dashed lines, we get this. So remember this y scale is, is in log scale, so this uh, deviation is actually significant. And we, if we increase more to 55 MeV, we get this yellow dashed line, which is more departed from the uh, line solid line that we sh that actually describes the experimental data moreover if we decrease the potential to 45 mv we get this blue dotted lines which is above this solid line in this case so we see if we calculate this scattering distribution using different values of the depth potential depth of the potential then we get different uh, these angular scattering distributions so Varying this uh, potential depths, we can uh, kind of fit the experimental data and see which of these will be 
will more accurately describe our experimental data and we find out that this should be the depth of the potential. Uh, this can also be done with the radius parameter. So for example, if we have the uh, radius parameter as 1.206, which actually describes the experimental data, we have this solid line, solid green line. And if we decrease just a little bit the radius of that nucleus, then this blue dotted line, the angular distribution will depart significantly from the experimental data. So this is how sensitive it is to the radius. And if we increase to 1.4 femtometers, blue dashed line, then also it will depart from the experimental data, so which in this case is actually described by this solid line. So that is how studying the scattering of nucleons from uh, uh, nuclei and uh, getting the angular distribution, we can choose different values of these parameters. So for example, in this whole potential, this V, this W, V, W, VSO, WSO, uh, and in VC, RC, these all are parameters that, that you can vary. So in uh, these functions F, which is both section potential, this uh, uh, radius of the nucleus and the diffusive, uh, uh, diffusivity parameter, all this you can vary and see how, which of these, which of the opt, uh, set of optimum parameters describes your scattering data. So that's how we can actually get quite useful information about the system, uh, nucleus we are studying. Okay. So we have, uh, see, we have seen similarity between scattering of light and nucleons, variation of energy with projectile. So the maximum then must shift according to the energy of incident projectile, which is similar to scattering of light. We discussed the form of phenomenological optical model potential. So that uh, long formula with lots of terms. And uh, then we see how we vary the volume uh, term, the potential volume term. So for example, 45 MeV, 40 MeV, then how the scattering distribution changes. And if we vary the radius of the nucleus, then how the scattering distribution changes. And how we can uh, fit the experimental data to actually get the parameters which describe best our experimental data. So these are the references for my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Viren. So the session is open for questions. Question. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, please, please, please. Um, the the parameters you have chosen for your optical potential. Yes. Uh, this is for a particular particular reaction. Ah, this is for fifteen mv neutrons and cancer forty. So this is actually scattering, not the reaction. So, but. Uh, Basically, elastic scattering only. Okay. So, I mean, yes. So, uh, even with that, my, my question is that when you are uh, concluding on the on the parameters, for example, here you have shown the V0, and in another slide you have shown the R0 parameters. Uh -huh. Yes. So, uh, my, my question is that when you use for this particular scattering, uh, can you take this parameter to a different scattering uh, experiment. I mean, can you predict the experimental output of a different experiment based on these parameters of your model? Okay, so uh, on a, for a different nucleus? Yes, because uh, these these are, these parameters are not nucleus dependent. They, they are independent of uh, any nucleus. No, actually, they, they are dependent on the nucleus. They are dependent on the system. So you so always first. develop all these parameters for a, for a given given reaction. That for uh, for a given reaction or, or scattering for your case, uh, you you change these parameters to pro produce the experimental data. Uh, so actually, this uh, uh, this uh, approach in which we kind of uh, decide the form of optical model potential 
and then uh, varies different parameters to fit the experimental data is called phenomenological approach. So uh, this is the thing that we do actually. So the parameters that we get after fitting the elastic uh, data, those parameters can be used for describing reactions, uh, further reactions which involve calcium 40, for example, in this case. So yes, these parameters will be different for different systems. Uh, did I answer your question? Right. So actually, this is the starting step of, uh, for example, if you want to describe some reaction, say for example, inelastic scattering of neutrons for calcium 40, then you have to have some information about the nucleus, the calcium 40. So you use elastic scattering to get both these parameters and then these parameters, for example, depth of potential and radius and other will be used in further theories uh, to get uh, other reaction cross-sections, cross-sections for other reactions. So this is exactly what I was trying to ask that uh, when you first uh, try to fit your uh, parameters of your phenomenological optical potential uh, by some scattering. Mm -hmm. That parameter, those parameters, can they be used for uh, multiple? Uh, uh, they can be used reaction? for different. Uh, they can be used for uh, multiple reactions for the same system, but with different energy. Now, uh, but with uh, different energy. So actually, uh, for example, if we uh, study these uh, scattering for uh, a wide range of energy, then we have uh, several sets of parameters. So we can actually correlate those parameters and find out, uh, for example, a function dependent on the energy of incident projectile, that this particular function reproduces well all these parameters. And then we can use those uh, uh, even without doing the experiment, we can predict that this this these parameters will best describe the elastic scattering data, but for the same system. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, sir, so, uh, no more questions is there. Let us thank the speaker. Thank you, Vain, for this wonderful session. Okay, thank so you. moving forward. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, student participant, Sikha Pawar. So Sikha, as a PhD student at IIT Roorkee, uh, she will deliver her talk. Um, yeah. Sikha, are you there? Yes, I'm there. So Sikha, your time starts uh, from now and uh, you will get 15 minutes. Uh, uh, try to conclude in between that, okay? So, and one more announcement is this. Our feedback link is provided in the chat box. Please do fill the feedback form so that we can provide your participation e-certificate through your mails. So, we have recently uh, published a paper on uh, microscopic description of traction odor nuclei. So, I'll be presenting that work here. So I'm apologetic to undergraduate students because it's going to be a bit technical. Um, so first of all, why, what is interesting about odor nuclei? Okay, so if we see the spectrum of an even-even nucleus, this 170 half neum, so we, within one MeV region, we only observe five levels. So if we add one more uh, particle, that is neutron in this case, so if you see, we get a lot of uh, levels within one MeV. But still, if you see the lower line, uh, lower line levels, they are a bit separate and more or less resemble the spectrum of uh, the rotor that is even even nucleus. If we add one more particle that is a proton in this case, 180 tantalum, we see a number of levels. It is like more than 100. And even within a few KV, 100 KV or less than 100 KV, there are almost 10 levels. So it is very difficult to identify the ground state spin and parity uh, in case of odor nuclei. Uh, odor means uh, the number of protons and neutrons both are odd. 
second thing is uh, odor nuclei have some unique fingerprints for example chirality uh, signature inversion and many more second uh, the interaction between this proton and neutron this is very important mainly in the lower lying levels so to consider all these factors we need a rigorous theoretical approach because experimentally also it is very difficult to identify these levels and to set a spectrum and one more interesting thing is related to the proton emission phenomenon where we observe the where we measure the half life so in the if we when we can uh, measure the proton emission half life we expect that if it is more stable then its half life will be longer and if it is if we move further from the stability region half life decreases but here if we uh, study an ordered nucleus we find out that even if it is more unstable than its neighboring uh, odd even nucleus its half life is longer so it's, these are some interesting features so we are mainly concerned with the triaxial odor nuclei where, where, where the potential is triaxially deformed so there are two possibilities like if the uh, proton angular momentum jp and neutron angular momentum jn are both in the same direction in that case the summation over their projection will add up and if they are in the opposite direction then it will subtract uh, for such a system we we can we have to consider both these cases in formulating our approach so the potential uh, sorry the hamiltonian we can write the uh, hamiltonian for the proton plus for neutron the intrinsic motion plus the hamiltonian for this rotor and the residual interaction between proton and neutron further if we include the pairing interaction then our uh, hp will be like Hamiltonian for single particle motion plus the pairing interaction, and the rotor Hamiltonian we can express simply like this, where R is the angular momentum of rotor and I is the moment of inertia along k axis. So k can be one, two, or three. So we have developed a non non adiabatic quasi particle approach, in which what we do is uh, we include the experimental energies of the rotor in that way it is more microscopic because we don't have to depend on the uh, on the fitting of the moment of inertia explicitly second thing is uh, because we are uh, including the pairing interaction in that case particles and holes we both treat them like the quasi particle interaction sorry we say them they, that they are quasi particles uh, then we don't ex uh, like in conventional particle model if you are aware with where we uh, expand every uh, term of the hamiltonian in raising lowering operators and it becomes uh, complicated so here we don't do this kind of thing we just use the angular momentum algebra where it's more sophisticated and the equations are a bit simpler and easy to handle last thing is we include the coriolis interaction without any approximation so in that way it it means that it is non adiabatic so we can incorporate the excited uh, levels of the uh, rotor in adiabatic case we cannot include the excited levels of excited states of the rotor so it's uh, there is no approximation here so what we do in the formalism uh, just the total wave function we can write like radial part and the angular part furthermore we can expand the angular part as the coupling of uh, rotor wave function and the particle wave function so after doing a bit algebra we can we can get the final matrix element like this so the pairing interaction we have incorporated in two ways first is we use some constant number with proper phase because we know that if we talk about gm splitting gm splitting favors a triplet state than a singlet state so we use this phase factor and similarly for the newbie shift which mainly lowers the all the uh, positive sorry all the 
even parity uh, even parity levels even spin levels than the odd spin level so and second we incorporated it in some uh, zero range interaction form so the final matrix element we get something like this and then we applied our approach first we tested it in the stability region so we chose 138 pm first we tried with assuming that it is actually deformed so if you see for gamma gamma is for the tractility if it is zero that means it's an actual case so and beta 2 is for the quadrupole moment so we we tried over a range of beta 2 and we figured out that it's not possible to fit it uh, with actual assumption because you see these gray lines are experimental levels and these blacks are um, our calculated ones so in all the reason this is for the 18 plus calculated one and this is the uh, experimental one so there is a huge gap here similarly for the band 2 there are two bands this is erast band and side band so here also though the lowest line is matching the gap is matching here but is still not good similarly if you see the staggering here these numbers are I mean, there is a huge difference between experimental and theoretical so then we did the, with the we fixed the quadrupole uh, deformation parameter and we changed the gamma so if you see uh, in, there is a huge uh, uh, improvement here in both bands 1 and band 2 so that is clear that we should include the triaxiality and it's a triaxial ordered nucleus so at gamma 25 uh, the results are the best so we tried on some other band also which has a different kind of nature uh, it is band 3 it is a negative parity band it is uh, doubly decoupled because there is a gap of 2 and yeah it is also matching and the fit is best around gamma 15 degree so the a more detailed expressions and the results all the investigations can be found in this uh, publication so now we can apply this approach actually our main motive to develop this approach was to study the exotic nuclei away from the beta stability reason as rain sir mentioned uh, what is the proton reply neutron reply so we were mainly interested to study these nuclei these are proton emitters so later we figured out that we can we can calculate other properties also like as chirality Uh, so which is a bit closer to the beta stability reason like these all red pentagons are chiral nuclei these blue triangles are uh, proton emitters so i mean we have studied so far these nuclei and we could ex- successfully explain the experimental data So that's all. Thanks for your kind attention. So now uh, we are ended up with our the event. So now I would like to thank uh, our speakers and the student participants and the pa- all other participants uh, uh, to make this event successful. And I would also like to thank our organizing committee member uh, to make it happen, and our technical persons also those who are working uh, days and nights to uh, run it smoothly. um uh, they are not in the screen but they are sitting uh, out upside the screen so and uh, our uh, um, seminar committee member i would also like to thank to all of them to make it successfully happen and uh, special thanks to our iqsc coordinator dr amajit basu for uh, this um, wonderful uh, seminar to make it happen very smoothly thank you thank you all and uh, if you have any queries or any uh, uh, suggestions please let us know uh, we will provide uh, our uh, mail id uh, right now in the chat box and the participants can uh, contact the our speakers through their mail id which is already given in the chat box thank you